Welcome back, everyone, to the next episode of Building the Board, brought to you by Bears on Tap and On Tap Sportsnet. I'm joined here by Tom Cavanaugh, Steve Letizia, and Robert Schmitz. And these are this is our scouting team. Make sure you go follow each and every one of these scouts. You can find their their handles, their social media handles, right in the banner that I just popped up below here. And what we are doing today, so we've spent the last about three, four months, maybe a four months and change, trying to watch as many prospects as we could, putting grades on them, and ultimately ending up with this numerically valued top 100 big board that we have. What today is about is getting outside of those numerical values and saying, well, our numerical values put Johnny Newton number five. Is Johnny Newton really number five? I mean, I want to think so. But I think I'm going to get some debate on that. So we're just going to go ahead and jump right in on this and start off. And if you're watching, if you're listening on the podcast over on YouTube, you can actually watch us build this board as we go. But our first few guys here, I've already filled them in, but we can debate them up to you guys what we want to do. I got Caleb number one, Marvin Harrison number two, and Malik Neighbors number three. So what are we thinking there? I think it's good to me. Yeah, I think that's a pretty accurate number three uh, or number three. That's a pretty accurate three top guys. I think Malik Neighbors isn't probably going to be in the top three for most people, but in my opinion, he's a blue chip prospect. Like if he, if Marvin Harrison wasn't in this class, I mean, he'd be wide receiver one in most classes. So with that kind of talent at such a premium position, I have no problem putting him number three. And then with Caleb Williams, yeah, you you might be able to argue Marvin Harrison Jr. is like the best overall player in this draft class but Caleb Williams is one of the most elite prospects at the most important position so again I have no issue especially with, with Bears lenses no issue uh putting him as uh number one on this board to me Tom the hard part about somebody like Caleb Williams is that if you follow any other sport let's use hockey as an example mm -hmm. here talking about Caleb Williams is like talking about a goalkeeper eventually he's going to let up a goal there's just too many plays where the quarterback has to do something where you're going to find mistakes. Whereas in Ohio State's offense, when Kyle McCord can't place the ball, you might give Marvin Harrison a break for a route that maybe he didn't run perfectly because his quarterback didn't deliver him a perfect ball. How's that his fault, right? I'm right there with you where if you scale Caleb Williams against quarterbacks over the last, let's say, 10 years, it's really hard to find a quarterback that's been better than he is. If there is going to be a quarterback that leads a board not just a bears board a board it's probably caleb because i don't know how you're going to find a quarterback unless you get caleb but he's two inches bigger that is going to have better tape with better accolades and more talent overall than somebody like williams and i it's become almost avant-garde to say that which is ridiculous because this time last year it was obvious to everybody but you get into draft season and everybody wants to break out their scalpel and over scrutinize right and Absolutely. yeah, for building the ba Chicago Bears big board, there's no way that ba Chicago Bears do not have Caleb Williams as their number one <laughs> overall player. So I think that's pretty safe to, to make that assumption here. So now at this point, then, who's number four? We got Dallas Turner here on the board. But what do you guys think about that? Who do you guys think we're weighing that against? I, I think, honestly, for me, it's a tad rich for Dallas Turner. I know Bear, the Bears need an edge. Uh, in uh, like the, kind of the worst way, if you're looking at just positional needs outside of quarterback, I like Dallas Turner. Don't get me wrong. I he's probably going to be end up being my top edge once I factor in the testing and whatnot. But like he's definitely not like a blue chip prospect. I wouldn't consider him a top five prospect in most draft classes. I know some of this is given what the Bears need, but I think there's just like a little bit missing on his tape for me to consider him here. Like a guy like Jerzon Newton who's right under there, I think checks all the boxes. His tape's dominant. He's been productive throughout his career. I think once he does do the athletic testing, he's going to crush it. Um, I don't think that, like, if you're going to weigh those two as prospects, I think Newton's, like, a far better prospect and uh, someone I'd way heavily consider in the top five than I would at Dallas Turner. So I'd agree with that. I'd probably have Newton over, over Turner. but So I don't know if I'd have Newton as my number four either, though. So it's like if we don't have – Interesting. You know, I love I love Newton. I, yeah, I I'm, really high Newton. I'm really high I'm, Newton. I'm high on him as well. But, you know, you got Joe Alt here who's probably more of like a – you know, most 
team's boards, I'm not even saying mine because I'm not as high on him as others, but most team boards, he would probably be in consideration there. I think Rome has to be in consideration too. Yes. So have a couple different options. Big thing for me is as I watch through the edges and as I watch through the DTs, I came out feeling like both DTs, so that's Jerzon Newton and Byron Murphy, who's a little further down the board, were better plug-and-play pass rushers than any of the edges. With Turner, you've got the size profile. Heck yes. you got the frame. Heck yes. You have the pedigree. Heck yes. You've got the age. Heck yes. You've got the athletic testing. Heck yes. But is he plug-and-play right now? Not quite. You are still factoring in a little bit of growth as a pass rusher that I think Byron Murphy tomorrow could pressure the passer at an NFL level. I think Johnny Newton has shown you everything you could want to see. My only concern with Johnny is that everything was amazing up until he had a Jones fracture. And in talking Mm -hmm. to Mason West from Windy City Gridiron, who's also a physical therapist in his real life scenario, he mentioned that Jones fractures can be a bugaboo for heavier guys because that's a planting foot that can become a major well you can lose a step and the moment that somebody like newton who i don't know if he really had a step and if he did he had one can lose a step and not suffer about a round's worth of production still good player but maybe not that blue chipper so medicals are something that obviously none of us have access to but it's more i'm using the dts to point out that to me if dallas is a rung below them he's probably not number four but i like the fact that we have turner over rome because if anything i do think that it's gotten really popular to say well roma dunce roma dunce is the clear number four he's a different player very good player somebody very exciting but tom how did you feel in terms of is neighbors and Marvin closer to each other than they are to Rome? Like if you were going to create a, I don't know, a tier system, is Rome in their group or is he maybe in a group between those two and the next group? I think he, they're pretty comfortably in their own tier uh, neighbors and Marv. I just think that they have all, they have it all. So maybe you could argue the production and the tape, actually not even tape. The production is as good for all three, but I think the athletic tools and then the tape, honestly, is just like a notch better than Rome. Like I think Rome is pretty comfortably like in his own tier. Um, whereas I think neighbors, like I don't know if I take Rome in, in the top five in most draft classes, but I would definitely take Marv in neighbors in the top five in almost every draft class. So I think they're pretty comfortably the top two guys. And that's nothing against Rome. He's a great prospect. I would absolutely take him at nine if I was the Bears. I guess I just want to clarify with Dallas Turner, too. I think there's a lot of guys on this list I'd have over him just because I think they're a lot more ready than the prospects. Like you said, Robert, you made a great it's all right. Tom, we're getting some feedback on you. We can't really hear you that well. I think that's you. Or maybe that's that was coming from too many mics open at the same time, I think. Okay, 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 we're good. You're good, Tom. Sorry about that. But, yeah, I think you made a great point, though, about Byron Murphy coming in and being pro-ready. I think that there's, like, missing elements of – like, and I think you brought that up with Dallas Turner. I think there's missing elements of that. In terms of, like, projection upside, he's as good as anybody in this class. Like, I think he has, the, of all the edges, the most, like, well-rounded tool set of athletic traits. But if you're going to be a top 10 pick, in my opinion, or a top 10 player – you have to check all of the boxes. And I think there's some that are missing on Turner's, even though I really like him. And I wouldn't mind if the, the Bears took him at nine. I just think in this class, which is a loaded class, I think there's some candidates I'd put above Turner, which is why I think four is a little rich. So if we're sitting here at nine and say everyone who doesn't have a number next to their name already is on the board, who are we really thinking is the top dog there? Look, it's not my position, so I defer to both Steven and also Q, but we're talking about a former linebackers coach who, like, he goes to bed at night and he wakes up sweaty thinking about three techniques. And so, to me, it's got to be one of those two. Like, (laughs) if you think it's Johnny Newton, defer. I tend to think he would be looking at Byron Murphy. I mean, it's it doesn't just take the Hogan Johns podcast that we just heard where, uh, what is it, um, uh, Josh Lucas has Byron Murphy at number three because that's not what this project is. We're doing our own grades. It's more that when I 
I, I, we talked about this at the senior bowl Q and Steven. I know I'm watching as much how a player moves as well as how they play football. And Byron moves very differently from most 300 pound human beings, which is always going to get my eye. But if you ask me, even if all of these players were there, I think either Murphy or Newton is the guy. What do you guys think? So from my standpoint, like I, I think I have to go into this saying with with Johnny Newton. I'm believing that where we're, where I want to rank him is based on his medicals checking out clear. Now, I know you'll get some pushback on that. I think that's a fair assumption. I've talked about Latu in a different light, but I just think a neck injury is a whole different thing than a foot injury. And I, I need to I put them in different aspects, different vision. But I see Newton and I just, man, I get, I get PTSD over the bears missing out on Aaron Donald by one pick because of how good his hands are. Now his first step, it's not Aaron Donald. I don't want to be sitting here saying he's going to be the next Aaron Donald, but man, you find an interior guy who can get after the passer with that type of hand fighting technique. You have something different. I mean, we saw last year, Kalijah Kansi had very similar hand technique at a much lighter weight. And Kalijah Kansi was trouble in the league last year. Like, I'm not sure there are many interior offensive lines that can truly block Jerzon Newton. And when I watch Byron Murphy, and I, I like Byron Murphy a lot, but I see a guy who has a lot of learning to do still. I see a guy who is going to get, um, he's going to get trap blocked constantly in the NFL. Because he wants to shoot that gap, and that's that's his go to thing. That's what he ha- what he wins with. It's all he really wins with right now, and that makes his floor to me like a Sheldon Rankins, right? A guy who can just constantly shoot the gap, and never really learned a whole lot more. Whereas with Johnny Newton, I'm seeing a really high floor. It's just that foot injury. That's the only thing that knocks him down at all for me. What do you think, Steve? Uh, you're on mute, bud. Nope, still. I mean, I can keep going on Johnny Newton. Just, uh, yeah, we're still not getting. There you go. There you go. I don't know. All right, yeah, I had uh, I had Newton over over Murphy, but it was close. Um, and it, basically for all the same things you, you were saying, it's just the hand technique and the hand fighting. I don't know what his foot's like. And Robert, you bring up a very good point uh, about what Mason said and everything like that. But I just don't know that information. I don't know what they have. So. It, to me, I thought that Murphy, uh, I'm sorry, Newton was a little bit better than Murphy, but, um, but kind of going back, I don't want to like backtrack a little bit, but you know, if we're talking like what the Bears board and what they're looking at, and I know it's smokescreen season, but they told us they were looking at edge, wide receiver, and offensive tackle. So on the Bears board, what I know it's, you're right, Iverflus wants that three technique. He does, but that's not what they said. So I don't know. I don't know if they would, would ha- wouldn't have Dallas Turner over. Newton and Murphy. Yeah, it's a, I mean, you guys bring up some good points. I think those three positions are going to be the only ones on the table at number nine. Um, And when it comes to Newton and Murphy specifically, I mean, we could talk about some of the other positions at play, or actually I should start off by saying my preference would be taking a wide receiver. If they can get any of the top three at nine, that's what I'm doing. I know that they traded for Keenan Allen. He's 32 years old. You got, you may have him for a year or two, I think you have to ensure that you're good at that position. If, if your job is to do everything right by the quarterback that you're bringing in, the Bears cannot mess this up, right? This is the best opportunity they've had to land a franchise quarterback ever. I think you have to prioritize making it right by Caleb Williams, and that's either taking a wide receiver or an offensive tackle, in my opinion. But if we're talking defensive prospects and we're going to stay in the three-tech, I think I agree with everything you guys said. I think Newton is more – probably the more pro ready um, in terms of a pass rusher. I do think Murphy's a bit better of a run defender at like holding the line of scrimmage and whatnot, even though I don't think he's like amazing at that. I just think he showed to be a lot better than Newton in that regard. I think the bears would lean probably towards Newton because they're so traits driven. They love traits. And I think Newton's pop or I'm sorry. I, lo- I think Murphy's pop off the screen a lot more than maybe Newton's Newton's more of like a smooth uh, technical 
pass rusher where Murphy is like kind of like a bull in a china shop, just like explodes up the field. I think that's more of the Bears' preference. Newton's but, the football um, player. Murphy is yeah. the athlete that might be an even better football player. Yes, yes, and and um, that's where that's where Poles is going to gravitate to is the athlete. I believe the other thing to to everything we're talking about because Tom, the other piece to this, and we'll get to nine when we get to nine, Dad Gummit. But I can't help wondering. If Poles and Eberflus are going into this draft thinking we have to come out of this whole process with a completed team, there's no room here to come out of this without two pass rushers, at least on your defensive line, because you can't win in the modern NFL without at least two guys. And you can't be so thin that if Montez Sweat goes down, you have no plan, which sucks because I'm right there with you. Roma Dunze might be BPA. When also when everything's said and done at number nine, and the Bears may trade off of BPA, but they've put themselves in a position after free agency where they don't really have another option to getting better at defensive line. They don't have a second round pick where guys like Darius Robinson could become somebody in play here. So you almost look at this and it's like, well, if you trade down, you'll have a shot at a pretty doggone good receiver in the middle of the second. We'll get there when we get there, but I don't know. That's all. It's all theory until you actually do it, especially if the Bears are in position to get sniped at or for wide receiver at eight. If Atlanta trades off and lets somebody else come up and jump the Bears. But Q, you're the GM here. Make a decision. Who is number four on the Bears board? I mean, so I'm kind of to, to the Tom's point there. I was kind of surprised we jumped to the defensive players that quickly because personally, my thoughts are. Rome is four, Joe Alt is five. That's where my head is at. And I think the debate really starts with the defensive guys after those two players. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's where I'm coming from. And I hear you, Robert. Like, I hear you about the Bears didn't really do a whole lot in the defensive line to kind of upgrade from where they were last year outside of obviously adding Montez Sweat last year. But at the same time, like, I don't think the Bears are competing for much this year. I'm not making decisions with – only this year's timeline in mind. I'm making decisions for the long term. That's what the draft ideally should be for. I know it's the NFL doesn't work that doing. way, right? Guys are making decisions for their jobs. I don't really know if the Bears are in that position, though. I think this regime has a lot of cachet, uh, warranted or not. Um, and that's why I'm doing everything I can to make Caleb Williams work, which is why I think my preference would be to go offense at nine, even though the glaring need might be on the defensive line. It's it's a funky season because I should make this clear. I don't think Matt Eberflus and Ryan Poles are coaching for their jobs. I think as long as they end up with six to, or seven to eight wins with some promise from Caleb Williams, they're fine for 2025. But if they can show George McCaskey a completed picture here at the end of 2024, God forbid they make the playoffs, they're getting extended. If they don't, they're coaching for the jobs in 2025. So that becomes sort of like a, it's like a look ahead year. Right. And if you go with the wide receiver and Caleb doesn't carry your team, which would be pretty weird from a rookie quarterback, good, but weird, then you have to coach for your job in 2025. Whereas if you try to complete the picture and everybody ends up looking pretty good and you win nine, 10, 11 games, it's a lot of ifs. But at that point, you get your paper and you can build this thing your way without ever worrying about any security. Hey, but that's all opinion. That has nothing to do with the Bears board because that's too much draft strategy potentially ignoring your like the best guy on it q if you wanted to put rome at four i back it i back literally anything you do at this point because i think this cluster of players is very tight okay so are we good with rome at four there and then uh, i mean i'm thinking joe walt at five do we do we have debate over that or does that one feel good i like too? it i like it yeah i love it and even steve likes it he's not the joe walt <laughs> fan in the room all right, so at six, this is where I think we get into the Dallas Turner, Johnny Newton, and Byron Murphy debate. And so we already talked through that a fair amount. I mean, I it sounds to me like the more – I think I am a little blinded by the tape on Johnny Newton because I love – I just love his tape so much that a lot of more reasonable voices I'm hearing are saying Byron Murphy – and I'm the last like week I've spent trying to figure out how much of that is just three weeks away from the draft hype. A guy always jumps up a board versus how much of it is merited. And I might've been a little off in my assessment there. So 
I'm leaning towards saying Byron Murphy here, even though Johnny Newton is one of my blue chip players in my grades and Byron Murphy is a red chip to me. Don't let group think ruin your work. If you think Johnny <laughs> Newton's better, put Johnny Newton. Literally. Yeah, I, think, I think he, I think he is better. I'd back you Q if you, if you want to go Newton. I was just going to say, I, Robert, that was perfect. Cause I think the three of us, Robert, I don't know where your rankings are, but I think the three of us all have Newton over him. So I, if that's the you, case, I think we, to, to tell you exactly where I'm at, and I'm no perfect voice, I think Byron has everything that the NFL likes to see. If you're mm-hmm. looking for a football player, Newton's a better guy, flat out. If you're looking for somebody who you could project to be the next Aaron Donald, I think Murphy gives you a better shot at that with a bigger chance of getting somebody who is Sheldon Rankins, exactly like you mentioned. I also think the when you look at the Dane Bruglers and the Mel Kuypers and the, or, or the Field Yateses, these guys do have more access to medicals than we realize. And I mm-hmm. would imagine the NFL is a little more wary of the Jones fracture than maybe we are. But screw it. You made the assumption that the medicals checked out. That's an assumption you are allowed to make, Q, because you don't have the information. Why believe what you think you're hearing when it could all be smokescreen anyways and everybody could be boxing each other out to try to go get Johnny Newton? List him. Take a stance. All right. Well, you guys got me. Six is Johnny Newton. And then so seven. Now, this is where do we think Byron Murphy falls at seven there right after him? Or do we think Dallas Turner is worth consideration there at seven. Steve, I see a pretty heavy J.C. Latham grade. Is Latham the better player? Jay-Z, in my opinion, J.C. Latham is a better player, but we're doing the Bears big board, and I don't think he's going to be high on the Bears big board, but I, I do love J.C. Latham. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think, I think. I mean, again, don't want to back up. I would put I would put Dallas Turner over Newton, not on my personal board, but on the Bears big board. I think that's where they would go. I think they want that outside pressure. I mean, I know it's smokescreen season, but man, they they haven't really had many smokescreens this year. They've made their their intentions pretty apparent all off season. I think they would. I think they're looking for edge pressure over interior pressure. I think they like Javon Dexter. I think they like um, uh, Zach Pickens, who they drafted last year. Um, you know, and whether they should or not, we, we don't know. But I, I think and- they're better off i think they're more likely to draft an edge than a t-tackle even if it's not what i would do even if it's a lower player on my board i think that's what the bears would do i think it's also important to mention they have shown interest in two defensive tackles who can fit that three tech and one tech versatility later in the draft and Dwayne carter and mason smith they have spoken to both those guys which makes me wonder are they thinking we're looking for a backup one tech who can kick to the three tech when the offense shifts. Not necessarily. We're looking for the three tech unless it's just that guy. And that's the thing, right? Newton and Murphy would be, you can't pass this guy. I think they have designs for Gravon Dexter to take a step into the spotlight here. And that would be a bro. I don't know what to tell you. We got the chance to draft Byron Murphy or Johnny Newton. That's how I, I, that's how I see it. I'm I, I'm thinking like you just took developmental guys last year. Like if you're gonna attack the position again, why not go for the clear? Uh, like like for as exciting Gervin Dexter showed to be towards that the end of last year. I don't think he's done anything in his NFL career thus far that would tell you that he was a better prospect or has shown enough in the NFL to pass on a Byron Murphy or Johnny Newton. Like I think they're that good of prospects to where like I don't. Like, I want Gervin Dexter to succeed, but I'm not counting on them being better. Um, so, yeah, I, but I hear Steve's argument that, that edge, I think, is a bigger need in the eyes of the Bears. I'm with you. My main thing when I look at Turner is if we're already making the argument, and I think it's a smart one, that the Bears do ultimately care maybe more about traits than they do about production, then the long arm Dallas Turner that would be a near perfect 4-3 weak side edge, not the strong side, but the weak side edge, where he's light, he's quick, speed driven, still has power in his hands, but he's also got a ridiculous length profile given that he's not that big of a person. This could easily get Matt Eberflus' attention. And if you want to put him at seven, I'm going to be the scout in the room that's just going to let you do it without thinking that this is one of my hills to die on. Does that make sense? Ultimately, I think where I why I land on Dallas Turner at seven here is the fact that he walked into Alabama as a true freshman and played true rotational snaps and then became the starter every year thereafter that 
Like he he played something like 400 snaps as a true freshman on Alabama's defensive line, which tells me that the kid works. You don't you don't play for Saban unless you work, and I think that's something that the Bears will value pretty highly. And I think it it still fits our Johnny Newton at six. I think they're going to love the fact that Johnny Newton led the FBS in regular season snaps last year on a broken foot. You know that type of stuff. I think really resonates with them. So I'm thinking Dallas Turner at seven here is the way to go. Let's do it. And then I think we can just throw Murphy at nine. At, at, I'm sorry, at eight then, right? Yeah, I agree. Murphy, just kick him in at eight there. And then so nine so happens to be where the Bears' actual pick is. This gets really interesting because, I mean, we got J.C. Latham right tackle only like based on what he's actually played, right? I mean, he might have more versatility than that. But then we got, on our board, we got two cornerbacks here. And Quinion Mitchell and Nate Wiggins, are those guys that we can really pass on? Or Laetu Latu, Brock Bowers, Jared Verse? I mean, I feel like this could be any one of six, eight guys down to Olu Fashanu here. It's Go a ahead, draft man. board. It's Drake, right? Like, it, it doesn't apply. I'm saying. right there with you. It's a draft board. I think if the argument is that, okay, the question that I'm basically going to ask everybody is, did we just wrap up all the blue chippers? Because if we did, yeah. Drake I, is probably the best red chipper here. I would argue Olu is a blue chipper. Uh, I think Olu, is Olu severely, should be your nine. Nearly slapped on in this class, especially for the Bears who like, you lo- you like Braxton Jones. I don't think you love him. Like I think he'll always kind of have some limitations in pass protection where if you have a clear – which in my opinion is a clear opportunity to upgrade in Olu Fashanu, who is like one of the better pass protecting prospects I've ever seen. I would classify him as a blue chip prospect. So here's a question for the the general concept of the board though. We pretty much, we have a really strong idea that Caleb Williams is going (laughs) 1.1. Yeah. Do we put quarterbacks on the board after that? I don't know. Q, I need somebody else to decide because I'm right I mean, there I, in my opinion, we're at the point here where we know enough. We don't even need to put quarterbacks on the board beyond beyond Caleb. Because why? I mean, if yeah. you're the Bears and you have Caleb 1.1, I mean, why the Bears are still going to have Dr- the Bears are still board? the Bears are still going to have quarterbacks on their board. They're going to rank all the quarterbacks. I mean, they're going to they're going to have quarterbacks on their board. But I don't I don't I agree. I just still agree that I don't think we need to. Right. If the Bears had the 12th pick, too. And Drake May is there. Would they actually take Drake May? No. You know, like that, that's no. where my head's at. O line boys, Tom has posited that Olu is our final blue chipper. Agree, disagree. I'm going to uh, just throw my JC Latham hat in the ring. I think he's a blue chipper as well. Uh, I think there's so much to like in his game. The athletic, him not testing athletically scares me a little bit. Uh, I still think he's not a, he's, if he tested, he was not going to test as like a, oh my God, this is a terrible athlete. Uh, but I do think that's a little bit of concern. But his, I would put his tape up against Joe Alts, Olu's, all of them. Um, you know, we can argue, you know, where they fin- finish, but it's on par at least. So I put, if we're putting Olu and Joe Alt in the blue chipper, I put JC Latham as a blue chipper. I know I'm higher on him the most. So if we don't want to, I'm fine with that. But I just wanted to say that before we move on. I mean, no, I honestly, Steve, JC Latham is, he's my last blue chipper among, among the guys mm-hmm. who are available. Like, I, and I, Olu's a red chip on my board. Um, and I think he's, you know, an outstanding prospect. I think I just might've been a little more hard on my grading this year on some guys and <laughs> he might've taken the brunt of that. But um, I mean, JC Latham is, I think as far as what you can define a blue chip as they're going to walk into the NFL being that dude in my, yeah. in my mind, that's what that means. And I think JC Latham walks in the NFL, that dude, it's just a question of, can he play the left side or is he relegated to the right? Sounds like right. he's number nine. Yeah, and I and I like Latham. I probably should have led with that as well. I really like him. He's honestly not too far off from Olu on my board. Um, I just – I think he's probably has a more complete game than Olu as a run blocker, mm-hmm. and then I think he's very solid in pass prediction. I don't think he's, like, the most fleet of foot in terms of, like, uh, trying to, you know, keep guys from crossing his face and having super quick feet in that regard to, like, recover – that, and that's where I think Olu has the leg up and where Olu's like ability is special. Like his ability to mirror rushers is, is top tier in my opinion. Like I, I don't think I've ever seen a, a prospect quite as good since as long as I've, I've been doing this and I haven't been doing it for that long. Um, but I, I understand Olu's limitations as a run blocker and that would probably 
lower him on the Bears board for for being well, honest here. I was it, about it, to say, Tom, I was waiting for you to admit that yeah. Olu is higher on Tom Cavanaugh's board than he's going to be on Ryan Poles. Fair enough. Fair and enough. Matty you got me there. Board. And Chris Morgan's board, who has more say in this than we would ever want to admit. But Fair do enough. we really think they would take a guy to replace Braxton Jones, who has not played on the left side? <sighs> Jason I mean, Latham I, I, has I said that he can play on left side. I know, obviously, he's going to say that because he wants to get drafted higher. But he played left tackle yeah. in high school. Did he? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I, I, I mean, it, yeah, they the all fact play left he played school, left but. tackle in high school does make me feel better. Um, because coming into this, I was I was honestly thinking Olu would be above J.C. Latham, even though Latham's a blue chipper for me, just because of that. Yeah. You took Darnell right last year. You know, it, and it, it's really hard to justify taking a right side guy again. Yeah, and I've seen it floated around to move darn our right to left left tackle. I don't think that would ever be yeah, on the table. So idea, yeah, 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 no, no. He's he's your right tackle. So if you did draft Latham, he would have to make the switch to left tackle. So I do think they might have you know Olu higher on their board just because he's a a left tackle. Uh, I mean, well, I mean they both could play left tackle, but he's a natural left tackle. I should say. I think I think we're in agreement here that J.C. Latham's the better player, but Olu's higher mm-hmm. on the Bears board. Olu, and then I can agree with that. To, to look ahead at number 10, it would not surprise me if Brock Bowers is going to be higher on the Bears board than some. I just don't think he's going to land in a spot where the Bears actually draft him, if that makes sense. Like, I think yeah. if you talk to the Bears scouts, they'd say, actually, they really like what Bowers brings to the table. Mm-hmm. They just never ended up in position. Like, right, right. now, based on our board, you're going to have access to 7, 8, and 9 at number nine in all Mm -hmm. likelihood. And then if you're going to trade down a little bit, you will either still get access to one of them or you'll get access to somebody a little further down the road. Now, am I thinking uh, maybe part of this is because if we're talking about blue chippers, Bowers is a blue chipper. He's just a blue chipper at a position that I personally think is really dangerous to draft high. And that's my own philosophy blending into it. But the player is the player and he's a dominant guy. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. I feel good about putting Brock at, at 10 here because I think if you traded down, that's probably that like you're not getting a better talent than that. Like as yeah. far as the guys on this board, other than JC Latham, who we just, you know, went into uh, ad nauseum about. So I, I'm good with putting Brock Bowers at 10 here. I'm good with that. Yeah. I mean, it, like kind of piggybacking off what Robert said, like it wouldn't surprise me if he's six or seven on the report. You know, but they're that doesn't mean they're going to pick him at nine because they understand positional value. And you're, I know he's he's listed at tight end. He's really a wide receiver. Let's call him what he is. But they still, you know, there's still some positional value to to take into account there. So I wouldn't be surprised if they had him higher on the board, but still like trade it down and hope to get him at 15, 14, wherever they trade back to. Makes sense to me. Okay, so for eleven, uh, I'll throw another one out there. Verse has got to be up there, right? He's yeah. one of the lower ceiling top guys in the draft, but also really high floor. And he could easily be that weak side edge that the bears are looking for. If that's what they wanted to do. Yeah. I, I think verse makes a lot of you, sense. You were, uh, muted? I was muted, but I realized as I started talking, Steve and Tom are the edge scout. So I want to hear what they have to say. I mean, Tom and I have kind of talked about this a little bit and Tom, you could kind of go, but like we would, I think, you know, it's very possible that the Bears have Verse very close to Turner. I think that even even though like Verse kind of fits more of their profile, I think they'll still have Turner higher because it's hard to not watch the two players and not come out with Turner as higher. But I know that they're we think they're going to like Verse a lot because there's the style he plays. He just seems like an Eberflus guy. Set in the edge, they value that. They value the uh, effort in the run game and stuff like that. And then he also can get up for the passer too. He doesn't have the bend that Turner has, and so he'll never be maybe that number one top tier pass rusher, but he also has a way higher floor than Turner. Turner could be out of football in a few years versus going to be an eight year pro at the least as a number two, number three rusher or worse. So I think they'll be pretty high on Jared verse. Yeah. I think they'd have Jared verse at least as their number two. I, I yeah, I've warmed up to them liking Turner. <laughs> more I, I think Turner's a, honestly a solid run defender um, in his yeah. own regard, but I think like in terms of like the way that these, that they want, their edge rushers to play. I think verse honestly embodies that the most like that dude just plays with his hair on fire um, is super tough against the run. Does all the dirty work um, kind of a vocal guy. I think they'll love all of that about him, but 
I don't think we should sleep on Latu either. My biggest concerns with Latu outside of the medicals, and again, we don't have you know the information to really comment on that, nor would we know what to do with it if we had it. But uh, I think Latu, his tape as a pass rusher is better than all three of them. And my biggest concern with him was his athletic testing. And while his jumps were great, his 40 was good. His 10 yard uh, split was good. And then his agilities were awesome. So I think he checked the, a lot of the boxes I was looking for, for me to have him as edge two, edge three. I'm, I'm assuming Turner is going to be the bears top edge. If they're looking for more of like a pass rush complimentary option to um, Montez Sweat, obviously I think Latu is the best of that bunch. So <clears throat> Again, passing along information that I've asked about, but it's not my information, to, uh, Tom. And you can do with this what you want, because at the end of the day, if you want to make the argument as medicals check out, that totally works for this process. Mason West said that of the last 11 football players that we've seen with a spinal fusion, 10 of them did not make it five years into their career. And the one that did, Leighton Vander Esch, just retired at mm -hmm. the five-year mark. And yeah. I'm right there with you that as a pure pass rusher, <laughs> Best pass rushing tape in the mm -hmm. class. He, the only thing he lacks is that first step explosiveness that really make you seal the deal with a player like him. The big problem is that when you say aside from the medicals, this is the player where you really can't say aside from the medicals. But Fair enough. unless you wanted to. And again, it's you guys' show here. I'm just throwing my like take in there where it's like i have no idea what to do with a guy like latu because i love him outside of the part where if verse plays for eight solid years under contract uh of different prices and gets you eight to twelve or eight to eleven sacks a year some of these on cleanup duty and verse play or and latu plays an exciting three and then he's done which was the better pick yeah, i i agree with that i think latu is going to be lower for that reason on every team's board Mm -hmm. just for what robert just said like i tape wise yeah we're talking about a blue chipper here the tape is amazing mm -hmm. but i went you back can't... and forth like he, 10 different he, times on him until i heard yeah. mason's comment and i was like mason's comment kind of cemented it home for me i was not aware right. that I, I knew he had a neck problem i didn't know he had fusion surgery though yeah that's definitely a wrench in this because he i i had heard he was talking to people at the senior bowl saying it wasn't as bad as they initially thought. And I'm sure he's obviously going to say that to help the stock. Like it's not surprising. I totally understand why he's saying that. Um, but that's kind of the information I had at the time, which is why I was kind of caping for him. Okay. So I think it we sounds don't like get it. we 11. don't get the medicals. Mm -hmm. We don't. Right. <laughs> it's such a right. huge piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. All right. So then at 12, what are we thinking think here with JC Lake is still on the board too. We got to mention could be Latham, but I just want to throw this out there because I, mean, I didn't watch these players as much, so I'll let the people who did chime in. But I think we got to start considering some DBs here. I know the Bears don't need DB, but they're still going to put them and rank them on their board based on like their film grade, whether they need them or not. And then once they get to the draft, they'll re maybe go down a little bit on the board and draft for need rather than taking the cornerback. But I think, I mean, Quentin Yon Mitchell, I've watched Kenyon Mitchell. He's worthy of a top 10, top 12 player in this class. I, I, I think we got to at least start thinking about these DBs here. Even if we don't talk about them a lot, just kind of put them in there and then keep going. I love DBs. I think we're getting there. We're not quite at their range yet. It's not that I okay. hate them. It's that offensive line to me is a much more NFL fond position. A defensive line, much more NFL fond position. We're going through ranking them. Corners slowly becoming a premium position, but I don't know if we're there yet, Stephen. And we haven't we haven't listed JC Latham yet for crying out loud. Like there's too many of these guys where I like Quinion Mitchell. There are there aren't holes in his tape. We just didn't see him against much in terms of competition. And yeah, it matters when you never got any reps against guys like Marvin Harrison. Marvin Harrison literally got Riley Moss drafted by himself because Riley Moss had a great day against him in particular and everybody watched it. Right. And it, it's funny how that works. So he goes up to the senior bowl. He dominates. That's probably a huge reason why he jumped from the second into the first. But there's still just little questions that you didn't have with guys that we had last year, like the one who Seattle drafted, whose name I am not recalling. And that's on me. Um, Nate Wiggins is awesome. Nate Wiggins has injury trouble. And so if you didn't have any injury trouble, I think Nate Wiggins would be in that category up in the top where you said, if you need a corner, you're going with this guy. But it won't shock me if this is quarterbacks, 
receivers, and then like trenches for a very long while at the early part of the draft, not just the bears, but in the actual NFL draft. And I would imagine that it's either Latham or, or that it's Latham because it's not Bowers that makes this one. Because again, DBs are ballers. Uh, don't let me, the DB guy undersell them. But also there are a few more questions with them that you don't have with some of the O-line guys. And especially when guys are looking for tackles that can play. And I mean, we've, we've all seen the data. Second round tackles are nearly as bad as fifth round tackles as fourth round tackles. It is hard to find tackles at yeah. the first round. It is, it's not the premium, the most premium position in the NFL, but it is one of the most premium positions in the NFL draft because it's hard to find the good ones outside of right here. I mean, I agree. I, I mean, Latham, I, I would put it way higher than 12th, but he should definitely be the next one up. But yeah, I mean, and again, I have not watched these cornerbacks as as much as you or as much as really you. anyone. I, I, I haven't watched much of these guys at all. So I'm just saying, like, I don't think we should forget about the position just because the Bears don't necessarily need it. We aren't. We <laughs> they just okay. end up a little lower, and that's okay. So, so then if we put Latham at 12, and then I don't know. It sounds like we're going to have lot to a little lower because of that injury from what we know. Um, I think Fuwaga, like consensually, everyone I think is going to ask, like, where's, where's Felice Fuwaga? And Steve, I know you did a pretty in-depth breakdown on his tape. I saw him kind of as a guard. I didn't really know if he could play tackle, especially not left tackle. Like, I think you question the range and pass protection and, like, how well he can move. I think he could be like an all pro guard if you did kick him inside. And I know the bears don't really have like an immediate need at that position, but if they are thinking long-term, like he could be a massive upgrade than what they have at the position currently. Which I just want to mention, yeah. Steve, your comp of Tevin Jenkins, I'm hearing everywhere now and you are the first person I heard say it. So I'm yes. giving you all the credit on that. Cause I think that is a great comp. Is it a Tevin I mean, Jenkins I that doesn't get hurt often? No, outside of that. Well, just, just on the tape. I'm, I'm saying if it's a Tevin Jenkins yeah. that doesn't get hurt often, is that pretty good player? At a mid first rounder. <laughs> yeah. Like he's pretty good. Pretty I get good. what you mean, yeah. Tom, where bad tackle, lower first round, really good guard. Quentin Nelson got drafted top ten. There you go. So if you're seeing you if you're seeing all that nasty, it, it could at least be on the table here because you know Ryan Poles is down to draft some old linemen to protect Caleb Williams. Yeah, I think I, I agree. He's a guard uh, most likely. Uh, and I think he would be kind of in the conversation here for what do we have 13? Um, yeah. I think kind of all like a couple of the, uh, I think I know Fatanu we're not as high on as a lot of other people are, but I think he would be in this conversation as well, just from like a bearish standpoint. I know they, they like that athleticism. So I, I don't know where he is on here, but I think he'd be in the conversation. I'm not saying we should put him here now. I, I would not put him that high. I'm just saying the Bears might might be higher on him than we are. I'm pretty sure they brought I, him I, in for a visit too, uh, Fontano, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and I think do. you got to start thinking about. I know it's way too high for a center. Obviously, you're not going to draft him this high, but on your board, you're thinking about Jackson Powers, Johnson, and Grant Martin. Both those guys are really good players. Maybe a little high for them right now, but we got to start thinking yeah. around soon. This I could really, also, I really this could like also be Quinion Mitchell area who I do okay. think ends up being the best corner. If you wanted to just mm -hmm. mail it in, put him there, not going to argue. Eventually That's we got to put him where I'm leading because he's, 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 he's at least a red chip, right? And, you know, oh, you're yeah. feeling Easily. like it, there's not many question marks with him outside he's, of the, the competition level. He's that magical pro prospect, uh, Quentin, where we'll all end up looking probably a little stupid, just a little stupid on Quinion Mitchell because there are no – really good questions to ask about his game. Can he play in press? Yeah. Can he play in zone? Yes. Can he play? Does he play well with his eyes? Absolutely. Does he move well? Yeah. Tested like a maniac. What's the big question about him? Uh, just, just that I didn't see him play in the sec. That's kind of a dumb question. It's, it's good enough to keep you everything. I talked about just a little while ago in play, but it's the kind of thing where the moment he rocks out in preseason queue, we go, okay, so he's just going to be really good then. And, and there's no <laughs> other question to ask there. He makes a lot of sense here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I like that. And then, I mean, at 15, I think, I think Fuaga makes a lot of sense from what I we were all just it. saying. And then I, mean, I like I, it. After that, I mean, I'm I'm sitting on the the centers, like we said, JPJ. Unless, unless there's other guys here who we think make more sense, like uh, I mean, 
it, I think it's too early to kick into these other receivers yet. But Agreed. yeah. Agreed yeah. Sure. I think pe some yeah. people are going to wonder where Brian Thomas is uh, on this list. Like, is he a trade back down candidate um, for the bears if they were to trade down and, and pass on this top of the receiver class? I really look at Brian Thomas as kind of pigeonholed with that next tier of receivers. Like, I don't think he's that much better than any, like he's not wide receiver four for me. So I would not, uh, I'm just addressing this now. I would not value him in the top 20. I would be cool <laughs> with getting whatever receiver you get for in the second round. If you were to trade back and get a second round pick. Um, the only other guy I think I may cape for is a Marius Mims. I think he's my OT four. I have him like as a fringe first, uh, second, early second round grade. And while I don't think he's necessarily like the best kind of like Olu is like a completely different player than Braxton Jones. I think uh, Denzel or Denzel Marius Mims kind of fits what Braxton Jones is, but I do think he can be a lot better version of what Braxton Jones is like win early in reps and pass protection, be a better run blocker. Just he's a more powerful player, a stronger player. And I, I, again, some people aren't going to see his, big of a uh, upgrade needed at left tackle as I do. Like I, I think Braxton Jones just is kind of a limited player. Um, so he's another person I'd probably get into this conversation. The biggest problem I'd have if we listed Mims too high is if I was a scout in the room and, and I wasn't an O-line scout and I heard you say that, Tom, I'd be like, I swear to God, if we take an, I hope he's better than Braxton player with a first <laughs> rounder, I'm going to lose my mind. We have positions that we need. We need legitimate upgrades. And I would say the words, I'm here for alt. You can talk me into Olu. Mm -hmm. But as yeah. soon as we start getting into the hopefullys, there are positions that we can take. Like, for instance, I would look at UQ looking at this board and I'd say, tell me about Chris Jenkins. We obviously have him graded high. Is he in this, is, is he in this conversation? I think he should be. I mean, I... Chris Jenkins is not a finished product, but mm -hmm. his floor is like solid run stuffing D tackle who in this scheme can play either D tackle spot. His ceiling, there's a lot of pass rush juice there that is just untapped high Raz. Like I want to say it was like a 9.6 or something. He's got all the athletic traits comes from an NFL bloodline. He grew up in mm -hmm. the Jacksonville Jaguars locker room. He knows what it yeah. takes to stay at the NFL level and to succeed there. And I, I just have a really hard time looking at a guy who, who did that with no character flags whatsoever and saying he won't do it. Yeah. I, I love Greg, Greg and Chris Jenkins that high. I think he's a guy who, if you just watch his highlights, you'd be you'd be underwhelmed by him. But the, from a snap by snap basis, his tape is up there with any D tackle. He's so good. So and really high floor player. I think they'll be, and like you said, can play can play one technique, can play three technique, can kind of do it all. I think they'll be high on him. Uh, um, so I'm okay with what are we on right now? 16? 16. Tom, 16. I'm curious to hear what perfect. you think, but I think the hidden weakness in this Bears D line is that if Andrew Billings goes down, they are getting rolled up the middle. Like the the Bears run stuffing capabilities is is not good if if big old Andrew Billings goes down. So if you're telling me Q, and again, this is I imagine what the Bears or what draft rooms are actually like, where it's like, I didn't watch him. If you're telling me that he can capably play the run, that makes two D linemen that can capably play the run right now. And that's valuable for what we want to do defensively. So yeah, you think you can get pass rush juice out of him? Good. If he ends up being somebody who can just play the run really well and kicks over to one technique, if, and when, gosh, we hope not Andrew Billings gets hurt. Okay. I'm here for it. Yeah. I really like him here. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I have not watched him. So, but I totally <laughs> defer to you guys. I'm, they need more pass rush help. They need more D line help. Like you, like uh, Robert just said, if you know Andrew Billings goes down, they could be in a lot of trouble. I love it ranking him here. All right, and then at this point, do we do we start to consider another corner, or is this where we think about Latu is or someone else on here? Wiggins' injury concerns are pretty pretty serious, right? I'd love to tell you that I know everything about him. I've I've just heard. Pretty major injury concerns. So you know what? Now that I think about it, most all. But if if it turns out that they're not good, then I would I would posit this might be our Latu spot, just because he plays edge. And I while had he's nothing got major... for his injury history, I mean that doesn't mean there wasn't one. I just hadn't found it yet. Well, if that's the case, then I definitely think Wiggins sticks. 
uh, because Wiggins is a corner that I have a lot of fun watching. He's the kind of guy where every once in a while you turn on somebody's tape and the guy across from him really impresses you. That's how I felt watching Kalen Carson, who I really liked. I thought Keon Coleman played even better. That's who uh, erased Taj. <laughs> That's who erased, um, let me see, it is Devontae Walker for me, where I watched him against Clemson and I was like, Oh my word, this corner is rolling. <laughs> that that Clemson or yeah. that North Carolina tape, I haven't watched Wiggins, uh, to be honest. But when I watched him in that game, when I was watching Devontae Walker, I was like, holy crap, who is this guy? He was like chirping yeah. and getting into his head like every single play. Uh, That's Wiggins. Totally tell That's Devontae what he does. Walker, he's just rattled. I think Wiggins makes a lot of sense here. Yeah, he's fun. He's definitely fun from what I've seen. And I mean, so he he uh, he strained a hip flexor at the combine. That's the only thing I'm really if that's, seeing. That, if that's it, then I'm much less worried than I was earlier. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not seeing anything else on the, his draft profiles, ours or others, mentioning it. So let's go ahead and do it. So that's 17. And then, I mean, in my mind, at this point, we're we're looking at a JPJ or Graham Barton or a lot to that. That's that's where I'm thinking. That's tough. Uh, I mean, how much do you? I mean, if, if the injury, you know, it, you know, if it is a spinal fusion, like they might not even have a lot to on their board at all. Like, that's very yeah, possible. Some teams, some teams won't for sure. So especially I think if- it. Especially for a Bears team, just throwing this at you, that's trying to win a Super Bowl in 2025, 2026, 2027. Right. So if you're not looking for one year juice, Latu could be really scary. And we also have to remember that this is this is still the time when consensus boards rule, right? Latu had great tape. He's going to be on consensus boards. Let's not forget that Atomila Adebuare was a first rounder and a late se- late second rounder worst case scenario for nearly two months up until he was picked in the fourth, the yeah. fifth. So, Steve, if you want to pause it, like we should put an NA next to Drake and also uh, and also somebody like Latu. I'm here for it. We need to give him a designation, for instance. But if you think he's just not on the board, like I'll support you in that. I don't know if we, if we can say he's not on their board, but I think you can confidently say they'd have other players higher. Um, it, it, it's possible they don't have him on their board, but I don't know if, if we run can and, make that decision for Run them. and shoot a little bit. I'm down to put guys in tiers, uh, Q, if it speeds us up a little bit, just because we went an hour. And I think that's good okay. on the first 20 or so. But the next, l- let's go 20 to 60 in 30 minutes. You know what I okay. mean? Okay. Yeah. No, we can yeah, do. Yeah. I, I like. We, we I can like do it. tiers the rest of the way, and then we can just go the numerical grade within those tiers for how they're ranked in the tiers on mm-hmm. the board. And yeah, that sounds good to me. I mean, to me, Watu, that's a Jalen Smith territory. That is, you're not touching him in the first round, but if you can get him at 33, you'll do it. I really like that. Yeah. I like it. I really like that a lot, Q. Okay, so I'm just going to call that tier. We'll go by 10, so that'll be tier 4, 30 through 40. And then, so we're still looking at finishing out tier 3. Tier Hit me two. with some linemen, boys. I know there are some good ones in this. And then Terion Arnold is obviously in this tier. Like Terion's really good. Coop's a really good football player. I'm curious as to what the NFL is going to think, but I'm not going to argue with Nick who had such a high grade on Cooper, that there's no way I could possibly bring him down. And so uh, I think Coop and Kool-Aid both get into this tier two category on the lower end of it, but tier two, nevertheless, and then Kool-Aid, same thing. They're all good players. They're all different flavors of corners. I wouldn't be surprised if they get drafted a little on the later side of where we have them, just because I could see them taken between, say, 17 and 26, maybe even a little later. But that's just because something that you guys have pointed out here that I really i am so glad we've still got you guys on this because this is your show for quite a minute. Let's not forget Cole Strange got drafted really high. Not too long ago, the NFL loves its linemen, and there are some banging linemen that we haven't talked about yet. So the way I see it, I'm closing out tier two with JPJ, and then the top guy in tier three is Graham Barton to me. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I I've had JPJ as my number one center for a while, and 
Graham Barton, I want to, I'm, I, I don't, I might put him over him at the end of the day, but really? I'm okay with having, I'm okay with having him like this for now. I'm not going to argue too much because it's, it's man, it's close. I really like uh, Graham Barton, but he definitely deserves to be they, those two guys in the same conversation. Yeah. And then, and, and then, yeah, I think, um, do, did we put, uh, uh Natuaga Fatanu yet? Cause I think he's going to be in this tier three as well, at least for the bears. We had not, but I think that, and, I think, and right. I think that fits. And Amarius Mims as well. I feel a lot more comfortable drafting Mims in this tier three yeah. than I did in the you know, tier two. You know how I would describe Amarius Mims to people? He's J.C. Latham without the proof. Yeah, that's fair. Ooh, I like that. He's got the size, the strength, but he's only played eight games and he's been injured. Yeah. So, continuing in tier three, I mean, I think this is where the receivers kick back in. Like, I think Lad McConkey is 100% in this group. I think all of these receivers, like McConkey, Mitchell, Worthy, and Thomas, I think these are the, kind of the the range where they would be. Now I'm pausing on on Worthy for a second because I do want to talk about him some. Do we feel more risk there with Worthy as being a you know 165 pounds wearing a four two one whatever it was? that is going up a little as he adds weight to actually be in the NFL. And historically those guys running those forties at those weights, not the most successful players in the NFL. Do, are we worried about that? Yeah, I'm not worried about it. I'm not worried about it. I think Xavier Worthy's tape is very, very good. And he's a much better route runner than he's given credit for. I'm, he's not just a four, two, one guy. I mean, he has the four, two, one, which is a nice little bonus, but the guy can run routes. And look at what Tank Dell did last year. He's smaller than Xavier Worthy and was really great in Houston. Uh, I think Xavier Worthy is going to be – I would have – I have Worthy over McConkie, Mitchell, and and Thomas. Remind me, he's... remind me, Stephen, uh, when did Tank Dell get drafted? Well, he got drafted in like the, well, I don't know, fourth, fifth round, whatever it was. He got drafted in the 69th pick overall. It's not that I disagree. 69th? 69. So nice, Next. first of all. Second, that's of all, not what I was going for. It was just higher than I, I thought I remember him going. It's it's more to say that you liking a player, this is the part where I think draft gets funky. Agree with me or don't. This is just, I guess, my take, right? Uh, draft gets funky because you can love a player. You can think that he might be the next Will Fuller. You can think that he's about to break the top off the league. That doesn't mean you have to draft him where you love him because the NFL won't. The, the NFL Q is always going to be higher on A.D. Mitchell and uh, who's the other one? Brian Thomas Jr. than they are Xavier Worthy because those twos are big and fast. Worthy is just fast and he's 165 pounds. And we have two examples of those guys being any good. And one of everybody's favorite examples broke his leg last year, which of course everybody's going to say, well, that's a fluke. And then somebody who's worried about durability would say, how do you say that? How'd you come up uh, to that conclusion? So my, 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 sorry, go ahead. Finish. Sorry. Go ahead. All this to say that to me, lad, I'm here for, I actually think lad's going to fall a little more, but that's just me. If we don't want to take Robert's DB or DB safety opinion uh, over that, I'm here for it. Cause lad does have some injury history is a little more of a part-time player than most of the other guys in this group and is only 185 pounds, but worthy is small. Like if Lad's pretty small, Worthy is very small. And that just has me thinking, Steve, that I don't know where he's going to go. I could see somebody taking him late round one. I could see somebody waiting on him until mid round two. But he just broke the record for like for, for 40s. He's going to draw some eyes. Yeah, I mean, the counterpoint is we, we've we seen players get drafted high because of their 40 time. We're talking about where we think he's going to get drafted. John Ross went ninth overall, and John Ross busted, you know, admittedly. But speed will always get drafted higher. 4 2 1, he's right. going to get drafted in the first round. He's going to get drafted higher than people think. Would not surprise me if he gets in the top 25. Q, do you want a tiebreaker or do you need time to stall? Um, I, no, we can, if we, we can go ahead with it. So, personally, I. I don't know. If we want to put him in tier four, that's fine. I'm not going to argue too much. If, where, if I'm overruled, that's fine. I think tier four feels safe. And, and where I hesitate with this is like, you know, Mike McDaniel has taken a big liking to 
worthy, supposedly, like down in Miami, right? And, and I look at that and say, ma'am, Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle, he's never going to be pressed. He's going to get a free release every time they want him to. That could fly. Like, that could be sick. That'd do you think fair. Waldron can do that with Keenan Allen and DJ Moore and Xavier Worthy? Because if he can, I understand what liking him this high more. But if we think that it's a little different when, you know, I love DJ Moore. He's not Tyreek Hill and Keenan Allen ain't running like Jalen Waddle. I think Worthy is a fun player. I think Worthy is a really good player. Steven, I, I'm actually with you. When Worthy comes out and makes Josh Newton look undraftable, you have my attention. I just mm. am very in my feelings about the way that the NFL treated Josh Downs and even Tyler Scott. Josh Downs was a second rounder by consensus, drafted third round. Tyler Scott was a third rounder by consensus and an early one drafted fourth round. This happens all the time where they take the small guy and they discount him around. And so yeah, Josh, Josh Downs ran a four five though, or something like that. I know, four, four, I know they're four, different. Four, four, it's very different. Josh Downs was also not as light if memory serves, but Hey, I'm right there with you. It's more about where do we want to tear him? If anything, hearing how passionate we are about these prospects is making me thankful that we did pivot to the tier system. If only because yeah, it's, we didn't even need to talk about guys like AD Mitchell, et cetera, et cetera. But so you, t- I'm, I'm good with whatever we want to do. I'm also, curious I'm good with them in, in tier four. That's okay. fine. Cool. I and think then, that's the way to go. I think that's a good tier for us to start talking about some of these other guys. Cause chop is another one, right? Hmm. Chop might end up a, one of the better edge rushers in the class, but we can't say that with any certainty right now because <laughs> yeah. he's a mess, a fun mess, but a mess. So if I'm looking at this, and I'm saying I'm the Bears. I'm sitting here saying I can have Darius Robinson, Chop Robinson, Jordan Morgan, Christian Haynes, or Zach Frazier. I'm taking Zach Frazier 10 times out of 10. Then he's in the tier. Yeah, I like it. And then, so after that, so we still got, what, three more spots to fill in Tier 3? Or we can we don't have to fill those necessarily either. But the my general idea is we can have ten up to 10 guys per tier. I like it. And I, I yeah. think Chop is probably, he's right in there as well as, I mean, I love Christian Haynes, and I think they're, my, if they feel like there's some center versatility there, I think Christian Haynes belongs in that tier. I like both those guys. I I couldn't. Yeah. I mean, I love Christian Haynes. I think, I think I'd put him in tier three. Um, And then chop is the other one we're talking about. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chop is so tough, man. I love, I I like chop, but I don't, I want to love him, you know, kind of thing. Like so much can go wrong with him. So I, yeah. Can we do that? Like, no, he's got to be tier four and we let the grade speak. Here's, okay. yeah. here's how I, I, see I, I, I think that's the way to do it. Because I think this will make our process as clean as possible with as few exception scenarios as, as possible, which we need if we're going to go through 100 guys and go to sleep on time, right? <laughs> what, what we're going to do is we're going to identify every time we go down a tier, we're going to just check mark all the guys that we think are obviously at that level of player. We're going to then look for the first guy that doesn't fit that list, and then we're going to figure out who is between them. Right, the last yeah. guy we have, and the guy we know is out, and then just start working from there. So, so do we have any tier threes left? I think Haynes belongs a, a tier above tier four. Uh, yeah, I'm fine with that. I like, like that. he's not going to go in the first round, but I think that from the Bears' perspective, he's that type of talent for and at a position where they feel like they have a need, sure. And then outside of that, I mean, I'm fine with closing tier three at I, this. I mean, I like Darius yeah. Robinson, but I think he's he's a tier below. The athletic testing really killed Dar- Darius Robinson. Yeah, I think he'd be in tier four. Tier four. Robert, how about Tyler Newbin? Nope. Let's go to uh, let's get let's sort it, and then we'll go through all the DB stuff. So all right. it, let's start with Newbin because this is really easy. He's as tier four as tier four gets. He is the best safety in a class that is so good and so specific and has so many very, I I love this class of safety because this class of safety speaks to my soul. There is a niche player for every defense, but there is no one size fits all. And the best one size fits all is Newbin, who is pretty good. And that's it. (laughs) Is he special? 
No, uh, not really. Honestly, he his instincts are not the best in the class. I don't think they're top three in the class. He's not the fastest guy in the class. He's not the hardest hitter in the class. He's just <clears throat> what people thought Cameron Kinchins was. Right. Yeah. And that's actually hey, exactly what I thought when I was watching him. <laughs> right. Exactly. And so that's that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. But I don't want to oversell it because, to be honest with you, I don't think Newbin ends up the best safety in the class. I think he's actually a little weaker at a lot of the things that are going to haunt him in particular. I think that there's like five safeties that are better in deep half coverage, for instance. And I think that there are box safeties that are better at the box safety role. But somebody's got to go first. And I imagine it'll be him. I also think Rake Straw is going to be fine in this category. I think uh, I, personally, I think Keon Coleman, uh, I'm trying to fill all the positions you guys don't have. Right. Well, I, think I mean, Coleman was the next guy I was going to mention. So Coleman's I think in Coleman's there. Here for. I like that Pearsall's in here. Uh, Steve, Steve, you don't agree? I'm going to be outvoted here. Uh, I would not put Keon Coleman in tier four. I know Fight Tommy me. would put. Fight I, me. I, 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 Robert, I know you're a big fan. I, I was, I'll just say Tom was the bit is the wide receiver guy. He, unfortunately, he had to sign off. He would agree with me. He wouldn't be, he would not put him in he, tier four. He wouldn't. Uh, Everybody hates the yards per route run statistics, et cetera, et cetera. And I look at Jordan Travis as a guy who can't place the ball to save his life. He yes. not to mention, well, that's true. not to mention you're talking about a unique Florida state offense that looks like this is just me. This is just what I see. You look at a Florida state offense. That's got Jaheim bell, Johnny Wilson and Keon Coleman on it. Nearly all of them transfers. And they all looked like they were promised to share the ball and they got their share to the detriment of the team. In my opinion, like it looks to me, Steve, as if they didn't cohesively come to the idea that he is this dude that or per se that they were going to share it. So I'm largely relying, believe it or not, Steve. Yeah, sure. Florida State his Michigan State tape rules. His Michigan State tape is where he was the organic wide receiver one and replaced Jaden Reed, no less, which says a lot to me about what the coaches think about him. And he was a beast in that role. So maybe cheating a little bit and looking a little too big picture at a guy I've been following for a hot minute, but I see somebody that'll at least be tier four. I didn't fight you that. I think he's tier three. So I'm just <laughs> trying to get him in here. That I'm fine with it. If you, I, I like his ceiling. I didn't, I think he's got a long way to go to reach that ceiling. Um, is that, is that's my only concern. If we want to put him in tier four, I'm not going to argue. I hear that. And then we can wrap up a lot of guys. Uh, do we really think Javon Baker needs to be in tier four? I w I'm, this I believe so. Guy. I know. I know. Tommy and I both have Javon Baker over Keon Coleman. So if we're putting Keon Coleman in tier four, we should probably put Javon Baker in tier four. All right. That's what the scouts have. That's what the scouts have. That's democracy then, right there. And then that's probably going to bring Ricky Pearsall and okay, <clears throat> Troy Franklin, tier five, tier four. Shoot, Steve. Me? Uh, I mean, if we're putting Baker and Coleman, I, I think you got to put Col Franklin too. It's like all these wide receivers are all just bunched together. I, I would put I would argue Leggett is the first guy out, but that's, what do you that's think? fine with me. Yeah, yeah. No, I, that's I fine with me. With I, all these all these arguing wide receivers are splitting hairs when we get to this point in the draft. They're so, they're so close. So yeah, no, I'm fine with that. And I do think we should put. In there. I think yeah, I do think we should. This is where Robinson, Morgan, maybe even Doralis need to be in tier four as well. And now for you yeah. boys, here's what you got right now at this point. Uh, you've got that gap between Franklin and Leggett. Anybody who is as good as Franklin, but a little better than Leggett, in your opinion, in O-line, they make tier four. Do we feel like Dorless really belongs in four? I like Brandon Dorless a lot. I think he he moves differently. I think he's got that twitchy athleticism. I I like him. I mean, but again, like we're getting to the point where I'm not going to argue too passionately about this. Yeah. If we want to put him in well, tier five, I'm fine with that. But my I like thing him a lot. is, if, if Dorless is going in four, I want Rook Rook row, 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 in four. How many people do we have in tier four right now? Yeah, like and that's the thing. I think we are pushing up on pretty hefty that's, limit there. Um, yeah, that's we got uh, eleven guys already. So I think it's time to push yeah. to tier five. That's fine. These next, yeah, I think uh, Dorless and, and Ruke are tier five. The receivers in this draft really are so funny, and I'm glad you guys see it the same way I do, where it's like you've got the top three, and then you've got a couple guys it, scattered until you get to this like top of round two group, and then it's just yeah. like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. 
I mean, like, yeah, I mean, Jermaine Burns also, I also really like Jermaine Burns. I know he's got off the field stuff and there's, that's a whole another yeah. conversation, but from a tape standpoint, man, it's really good. So like, it's tough. I mean, I, I put him in the same conversation, but I haven't watched. So, oh, um, I would recommend it. He's, I, he's, he's good. If we're talking about uh, quarterbacks who let down their wide receivers, Jalen Milroy, Milroy left well, down Jermaine Burns. I heard. Burns. That much so, I heard. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I think he'd be a tier five for me. So good. But I think his off field questions yeah. are really going to push him down this board, down like tier yeah. six, seven, personally. Oh, yeah. Could, he'll be off. He'll be another guy who's off, guys. Uh, off teams boards for sure. Yeah. Because, I mean, there's the the whole thing with um, after the Tennessee game last year, he you can go find the video online. He walked up, to, like the Tennessee fans rushed the field and he walked up to one of them, just like tapped her in the head. And it's just like, why? Yeah. Why would you do that? And it became yeah. this whole big thing. Maybe it was more than a tap. The video, it, it looked like he just like pushed her head. It's just bizarre and that that's something that just doesn't sit right with me and i think is really going to sit wrong with the bears yeah just looking down this list i see now i we completely missed tyler guyton i feel like we uh need to move him up a few tiers do it i think that's a uh a tier three guy yeah i think i think there might be a typo in, in someone's uh grades for him maybe but i know like he's he's like a i don't know but i think he's definitely like a tier three probably now let's see. So Guyton. Oh no. I guess yeah, maybe, so not, we, maybe uh, I, mean, I knew I had him sitting in a mid second round territory, so that, that's yeah. probably about right, but on pure grade, but that just you know if, you can if we're just talking about like where upside. where he's yeah, where he's gonna get drafted. He's gonna get drafted or, late first, probably. So I think I'd say tier four with him. Okay, honestly. I'm fine with that, yeah. Definitely not tier five. Yeah, tier four no. sounds good. And then, so, let's see. So, our tier five, we're still working through tier five. Let me resort this. Okay, so, when you keep adding the tier five, I don't think linebacker is even in consideration in this tier. So, I don't think Peyton Hopefully. Wilson is a guy here. Hopefully not. Um, it's a Steve. messy linebacker class, man. Like, I wanted to see some really good players, but there was this point cue where I remember you and I were scouting linebackers, and I watched Peyton, and I was like, yeah, Peyton's going to get a lot of play. You just know this guy, kind of guy will, but he's mm -hmm. hilariously old. I watched Edgar and Cooper, and I was like, this guy's got a lot of pop. He's a lot of fun, but, you know, I can't wait until I see better. And then there wasn't any better, and I went, wow, yeah. okay. <laughs> This position is dying, but yeah. <laughs> they're all playing tight end now, didn't you? We're playing safety. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, you're telling me Jaden Hicks <laughs> isn't a former <laughs> linebacker? You're nuts. Like, yeah. but so, Steve, what do you think of Braden Fisky? Fisk, uh, I liked him. Um, I didn't love him as much as you know, he, I feel like he he's killed this offseason, he's killed the, the draft process. Um, I liked his tape. I think I, I think he'd be in the tier five. I think okay. he does a lot of things well, but he's not. I think his well, upside to be, is a little limited. So, just, and just to clarify, our tier fives, that's like picks 40 through 49. Mm, is the I, general okay. idea here. And I think that, yeah, that, I I guess think that he's makes more sense. six, seven personally. Just because like, yeah. the rates are nasty, but the the shortest was, arm, might be the shortest arms AD tackle in the class and a guy who just leads with his helmet into every snap and is going to be like 24 years old. Yeah, high motor guy older. Yeah, tier six, maybe even tier seven. Okay. Let's just put him six for now. And then, so, I mean, we got to find more tier five guys. This is where we're hitting a bit of a wall. Braswell? Uh, That's tough. I like Braswell, but didn't love Braswell. I feel like he would, I top 50 for him would be a little bit rich in my opinion. But I feel like he he would be in the conversation, if, depending on who else we got. I like Michael Hall a lot. I think he could potentially get in there. Maybe it's a little early. I like the fact that he beefed up to like two ninety five for the combine, just because it shows that he's yeah. capable of that, and he was, he's still tested two ninety nine, and also had uh, Raz. Yeah. I, I like. I think a lot. he's I'm pushed like up five. to tier five, even though yeah, I've had yeah, him a third like rounder that. this whole time. Like I, I think there's yeah. something there to think about. Kamari Lasseter, Rob. I thought he was fine. I'm going to stick him in tier six and that's going to be okay. okay. Uh, I think Cam Hart and TJ Tampa are your tier fivers. 
at this point. All right. I love that Cam Hart. Uh, I love his tape is fun. His tape is fun. He's a big, long physical corner, and that's always going to be sought after in the NFL. And while he is a little bit older, I I would just not be surprised if people are going to look at the ready-made player that he is and say, well, I want that on my team. The 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 player that we didn't get into this just because I don't know where he's going to land and I don't know if he's going to make our top 100. Um, Kyrie, mm, I think it's Jackson. Kyrie Jackson, uh, the corner out of Oregon. Oregon. Yeah. He's one of the only other guys that fits in a, the same mold of just big dude that is yeah. also like fast enough to play the position. But I care a lot about the senior bowl and his senior bowl was pretty bad. Yeah, so, I've, got him, I've got a grade on him at 130 here. And right. That might be a little low because of his traits. But that's like, the I, thing. I'm I'm not expecting us to be so nails that we we have to be perfect. But he's the only other guy in that category. And I think it's I think it's really easy, Stephen, to lump every corner into corner. They're very different. And mm-hmm. Cam Hart is playing in a rare position of big dude that's going to play outside corner think that matters for him so do we think Leggett belongs in tier five i would i would well tape wise burton has better tape than Leggett, but i understand off the field concerns there i don't know how much we want to weigh that because we don't know we don't talk to to everyone but i think we can put burton to my gut says tier seven but the talent says tier five so i think tier six just makes sense makes sense to me how many people we got in tier five? Only like five or six. Yeah, we've got five there right now. Is Rome Wilson? I mean, I, if, if we're that... not comfortable, uh, could go either one. But I think if we're not comfortable with another guy in tier five, I don't think we des- necessarily need ten guys yeah. in tier five. If they if don't. we think there's, we, I don't want to force it just to get a guy, just yeah. to get ten guys there. Yeah. Okay. Then we'll we'll leave that. I mean, we can leave five as is if we want to add a guy later. We can, uh, because yep. I I think Leggett tier six makes the most sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just outside the top fifty. Yeah, fifty to <laughs> fifty nine. Yeah, Does that work. And yeah. then Braswell. Leggett, Leggett freaks me out. When I look at Leggett, yeah. I see Jonathan Mingo. I see none of the production yeah. that Mingo had. I see major age and athleticism concerns. And Stephen, he had his quarterback at the Senior Bowl, and he didn't light up the Senior Bowl. What? I didn't and, even think about that. And after the two Senior Bowl, years, yeah, it was rough for him. And after two poor days at the Senior Bowl, he opted out of day three anyways because he didn't want people to see any more than they already saw. I mean, by no means am I trying to poke too many holes in the guy's game. There's just a lot of receivers. Like, it's that moment where you go, Robert, would you rather Xavier Leggett or Roman Wilson? Roman Wilson. Robert, would you rather Xavier Leggett or Keon Coleman? Keon Coleman. We'd probably have to sift before you get me on Leggett because I see him as – exactly the kind of guy steve this is the big one steven i'm talking to you because you you did wide receivers he's the kind of guy that screams he's gonna get overdrafted to me not only did they massively overlist him so everybody film watched him as 6 3 230 finally weighs it or finally what weighs in he's 6 1 2 230 mm. and so that pushes him from an x profile to a z profile look i keep going i don't hate the guy it's more like i think he's somebody who because we placed him really high, we are not willing to let go of what we might be seeing develop in front of our eyes, especially since Jonathan Mingo, I mean, you guys tell me what you think, looks like an overdraft uh, on early returns. So if you could get Leggett in the third, I'm here for it. I don't know if you can yeah. get Leggett in the third. So I don't know if I would want to. I think he's definitely a guy who's in danger of getting overdrafted. Um, I do think his tape is pretty good, though. I, it is. I, don't, I disagree. I disagree with the athletic concerns. I have no no concerns about the athletic athletically. None. Um, I my biggest I concern about him is is the why did you just start producing as a fifth year senior? I know there were things in his history that you know that it made sense, but typically those guys don't work out. And I, the my, the Mingo comparison, I think, is an apt one. I think that's. I th- I think Legat is better, but I think it's a good comparison still, um, because a guy who does is not a great route runner and kind of just you know run after the catch guy and 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 stuff like that. So if, if we wanted to bump him down to tier seven, I wouldn't argue too much about him. But I do I do like him. I I'm would have him in tier, tier six, six, but 
do you I, think that he is on the level of Roman Wilson? I actually had him higher than Roman Wilson slightly, but you have this guy. I could, I, but you know, I go. I'll ask me again tomorrow, and I'll probably have a different answer for you. That's how this this tier of wide receivers are right now. It's so it's different every day. As we're talking this through, I'm actually sitting here thinking Roman Wilson is the final guy in tier five. Makes a lot of sense to me because he's ahead of Jermaine Burton. He's ahead of Xavier Leggett then, even though he's not on our board here. So he'll be the last guy in tier five right like ahead that. of those two, which I think makes NFL teams are going to NFL teams are going to like Roman Wilson. So that, they are. yes, I like it. Okay. And then, so continuing with tier six, I mean, we think Braswell goes here. I think he does just because premium position. Uh, yeah. And there's like, I think he would go in tier six. I and mean, there's not a lot of like edge. There's not a lot of depth in the edge class this year. So I think he'd be kind of drafted higher than we'd probably feel comfortable. And then, so, I mean, I, I, I have a hard time putting the linebackers ahead of like a tier, tier seven, maybe even yep. tier eight. Um, I think Cooper Beebe is probably a tier seven guy. <laughs> Dwayne Carter's probably like tier eight, realistically, even though I like him a lot. I, I think he's a guy who is going to be higher on the Bears board than where you need to draft him, I guess. Um, so, I mean, I, I really think we can wrap up tier six and move on to tier seven at this point, unless we want to, yep. unless we really want to reach on like a Javon Bullard here or something. And I don't think no, you do. I think tier seven is fun. Okay. So, tier seven, I like Cooper Beeb in here. Yep. He's going to be a hell of a player, but yeah. not not up, no upside. Well, not no upside, but not as <laughs> yeah, much he's, upside. He, he, he is what he is, and that's what he's going to be kind yeah. of thing. Um, and then I like Jalen Wright in Tier 7. I do, I too, especially with his speed. I, actually, I mean, I, I almost think it through. I almost like him as the last guy in Tier 6 because I think he has he, he can be a game changer. I, I love Jalen Wright, so I'm, I'm all, all on board with that. Okay. And then, so, with Tier 7, I like Tier 8 for Dwayne Carr, so I'm just going to go ahead and put that in there, if you guys are cool with cool. that. And yep. Jonathan Brooks, I think I, I would have him near Jalen Wright if the, if the injury is a concern there, so I think Tier 8 makes sense. Yep. And then, man, Devondre Sweat, I mean, I, I'm i pushing him way down my board after, yeah, after yeah, today's dude. news with the DWI. I mean, I just don't think there's... I was already. Pre- I know you loved him, Steve. I was pretty skeptical of guys that heavy in general, usually. So it was just a fun tape to watch. I I, I would have probably put him in tier seven, you know, tier seven or eight before today. Probably tier seven. So like, yeah, definitely nine, ten okay. off off team sports. We'll we'll just hold him off for now. Um, so keeping up with tier seven though, what what do you guys see here? Like Javon Bullard, Mike Zane, Restrill, um. I could see a Zach, a Zach Zander is probably eight. Um, what do you I know? I, I think ahead. Rosengarten belongs in tier seven. I, I love Rosengarten. And I think, you know, I, I forget who it was. Was it Kuiper or Darren Jeremiah? Someone had him in their, in their like first round mock, which I think is a little high, but I think it goes to show that NFL teams like him because they didn't do, they didn't put him in their first round mock for no reason. They did it because they heard that from, from a team. I think a playoff. So, I think a playoff team is going to be seeing him at the back end of the second round and loving it. So I think yeah, that makes so sense. I like him at tier seven. Then, I am going to say I think Bullard makes tier seven. I think Sainer still is in tier eight. Bullard okay. is at moments the best safety in this class and at moments the most exciting safety in this class. It's all the other moments where he's not. And you can tell he's a guy who's been playing safety for a year. To be honest with you guys, I feel kind of bad for him because I'm sitting here like, give me one more year of tape. Like he started playing <laughs> safety in camp this year. It's just obvious because on 75% of scenarios, I don't see him react. Like I see a lot of the other safeties react, but is that his fault? No. Can I project it better? I don't think so. Like I can't just do that for him. So the athletic yeah. ability absolutely matters. Saying still is a super fun player. I just don't think he can play on the outside. How high can you really draft a nickel? Probably about mm-hmm. there, in my opinion. The other one that I think we should at least talk about, and I don't know if I'm going to be singing to uh, to boys that agree with me or boys that don't, 
eventually Ben Sinnott is going to crack this list. He, I'm <laughs> like, I was, I was yeah. just about to make a case for tier six for Ben Sinnott. I didn't <laughs> yeah. I, before, and I think that he is not getting out of the second round. I think I he's like going to be tight, tight end too. So yeah. yeah, this suits my, uh, this fits my agenda. So I'm here for it. <laughs> Let's do it. I, I like what you did there. One the thing I'm really noticing. The one thing I'm really noticing, because I've never actually like gone through the board like this and like gone down it, is that there is a huge drop off in talent. This is not a deep class. Like we're getting to the bottom half of our top 100. I'm like, yeah, I like some of these guys. They're not top 100 picks. There's a huge drop off at, after pick like 50. I'd say the top 50 is real nice, and then not a whole lot after that. Like these are guys again that I I like, but a little rich for some of these rankings. Steve, we're Bears dudes, so it's really easy for us to get caught just supporting the organization in literally anything they do. This is the mm -hmm. rare draft where I actually don't totally mind the Bears plan here of yeah. they'll get you one of the sweet ones because the top eight to ten sweet players. The next ten mm -hmm. after that, still pretty doggone sweet players, but it decays pretty fast outside it, of receiver. Yeah where I think you've got yes. some really strong bets in the second round in receiver, but mm -hmm. I don't know. That's all very specific. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I'm with you on that one. Do we think and this Trey exercise Benson, just hammers at home? Trey Benson, do we think he belongs tier seven, tier eight, or someplace lower? I think tier eight. I think tier eight would be good. He has, he, he, he has some moments. Yeah, I, I like his tape. I don't love his tape. You know, it's yeah. like I, I see all the all the good, but I don't see it jumping off the screen enough, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, if we want to go even tier nine, I might find out that too. Mm, yeah, I think uh, he belongs a, a tier below Brooks, actually. Okay. Oh, yeah, if we have Brooks, yeah, okay. I like that. And then, so, in tier nine, I think that's where we have Peyton Wilson. I, sure. I like it. And I, I mean, I think we're still waiting a little bit longer for uh, Edger and Cooper there. Um, and like, man, a tier. Leonard Taylor the third has to come in somewhere. And I don't know <laughs> where because he's so skilled. Like he jumps off the tape in the worst kind of ways and in the best kind of ways. And then he went and tested terribly at the combine. And that scares me, but also he was playing nose tackle all year for a team that lost their nose tackle at the start of the season, and he's clearly not a nose tackle. Yeah. If you, if you feel strongly about him here, go for it. I think You've watched nine, more of him than I have, so it's up to you. I think you'll take a chance on him in, at Tier 9. Gamble on the trades. I like it. Yeah. I'm going to throw my my hand in the ring for Jalen McMillan. I think he he's a really good football player, and he was injured this year, so he hasn't been talked about a lot, and obviously he gets overshadowed by Rome, but he's a really good football player. I'd put him uh, maybe even in Tier 8, but at yeah, least I was nine. thinking Tier 8 for him. And then also with Tier 8, I would consider Zach Zinner. Okay. Because <laughs> I, I, I think like he's that. his lack of ability to test in anything has knocked him down, but he is a hell of a football player, and he just he just wants to hit people. And he's perfectly capable of it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then, you know, I'd, I'd consider putting Junior Colson in Tier 9 with Peyton Wilson. I haven't watched him. What do you think, Rob? Junior Colson up there with Peyton Wilson in, in the same tier? Or I like tier below? him. This is yeah. this is the Michigan one, right? Yeah. Yeah, he can play. Like, I, I think that, if anything, I'm just glad you're not trying to talk me into Trotter because I did <laughs> not love what I saw from Trotter. But I didn't mean trying to be a hater. Draft Talk will put you in hater mode, especially in February. Like, what, was there any of these guys, Steve, not to get too sidetracked on a pod, we need to finish it here at some point, but who's <laughs> the guy who you were high on immediately that maybe it took a couple months? but you sounded less and less crazy as the draft process rolled on. So a guy I was high on initially, and then they caught up with somebody or... who you were high on, but the rest of the draft machine 
still had in the second or third or fourth round. And then they ended up rising. But you were like, they're going to be there very early. Uh, um, who was, I'm sure there's examples. I know I was really high on Hunter Nors- Norzad pretty early, but that's not a first, that's not like that first round guy. But I, have and also, Keanu yeah, I think Benton. that's a guy that Keanu, Keanu Benton, Benton was last, year. last year, where people mm-hmm. had him yeah. in the third, fourth, and Quentin was like, he's closer to the first than the fourth round. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we got there. I mean, for Steve, I'd, I'd say it's Tanner Bordellini for you. Tanner Bordellini, another one. Yeah, I you was were big on him early, early, and he's he's been a riser. Now, top, yeah, I think I think top one. I mean, he's gonna go. I I would put him right around like the top one hundred. Okay, probably so a, a little bit out. on him because we're in like the seven yeah. range right here. Personally, yeah, I know you're lower on him than me, Steve. But Bo mm-hmm. Limmer, but I like him. That's seventies. That is a seventies pick right there. Yeah, if you feel strongly about it, I'd say go for okay. it. I'm not going to argue because I do like his tape. I was just higher on other guys, but and then, man, I want to put Austin Booker in there, but that athletic test didn't scare the crap out of me. <laughs> I mean, I think Blake Fisher falls right in here in the seventies, as far as being, a, I mean, an offensive tackle who has upside. Yeah. He might even be a little higher than this. I might even argue tier nine for him. Yeah, I'd put him in tier nine. I like his tape a lot. And then. Like I think a, Coleman, Rob, have you watched any Duke Mary and Richardson? Or Steve, did you I did, did you add him on? I actually did watch I watched some like I randomly watched like a few cornerbacks here and there, and I picked him only because I think Chris Sims had him like his like top five. I was like, okay, let's see what he's got. Uh, he was pretty fluid. I only watched like one or two games. Uh, so I'm not gonna argue passionately <laughs> passionately I, about him, but I, I thought he was pretty him. fluid and fluid hips, so I didn't make it to him. Uh, just to be very real with you, Nick and I had a pseudo deal where I needed to get all the major safeties and then get as many corners as possible. And he was going to yeah. get all the major corners and uh, get to as many safeties as possible. Uh, and so I, I didn't get to him. I'll rest on your eyes more than any, Steve. I really think this corner class where this gets messy, man, is that I have come to believe that DB is a drastically broader position then we make it D line is D line. That's not to say there aren't different ways to play D line. It's to say that there's always going to be less big dudes that can move well and also stop the run and also rush the passer than the league wants. And when it comes to DBs, whether your DB style is valuable or not is a massive driver. Sainer still is one of the best pure corners in this draft. He's just not big enough to live on the outside. There's no way. And especially in a league like this, I mean, Q, just to use an example, like I love Drew Phillips. I really like Sainer still. What are these guys going to do against Justin Jefferson? What are these guys going to do against Brock Bowers? That's life in the NFL. And that's something that will always bug me when it comes to corner in general. Dick Marion, I don't know a thing about him. So Steve, I'll go with what you see. What kind of corner is he? Big, tall, or just like regular size guy that lives on the outside and maybe could play inside if it gets bad? No, he's an outside corner, tall, lanky guy. Um, but yeah, I think he was like 160, 170 pounds. Like he was like six one, some like something like that. Like, Ooh, again, the I, Emmanuel I Forbes kind of thing. I think we could exactly. put it in your ten pretty comfortably. Okay. Sure. I, now I think Max Melton belongs ahead of him. Personally. I love Max. I think Max is somebody that his biggest flaw is that he was considered a sixth rounder two months ago. And yeah, people I, are wondering, I think that's a tier nine guy. Like, I, I as think so. I pulled him up down here. Now, I, I'm okay with putting Richardson in the tier 10, but I think we put Van Pran and Jalen Polk in tier 10 as well. Sure. I mean, if we're uh, if we're putting Van Pran in tier 10, I want to put Norzad and Bordellini in tier 10. I think they're better players. Or at least I, agree. I was I was just about to say the same thing, Hunter or uh, Steve. I'm not talking to Hunter Norzad. I'm talking to Steve Letizia. <laughs> oh, I see. Tier 10 is tier 9.1. To yeah, because it, right. it, it, tier 10 goes back up to the top when I sort. So we're I like uh, that. switching Smart. that up. Smart. A bit. It's problem solving right there. And then beyond those guys, oh, yeah, I said we got to get Van Pran in there. I mean – Bernardo Green was really interesting tape to me. I, I thought that he 
was feisty. I'm pretty sure he's pretty big. It was a few weeks ago that I watched him. Let me see. I can pull up his stats here. I don't know what happened to his Six grade. Foot, 186. Go ahead, Rob. I don't know what happened to his grade, but the only safety DB that I'm going to fight for in uh, Tier 10 is Caleb Bullock. Uh, I think Caleb Bullock is a product of a horrific USC scheme. When he actually got opportunities, I thought he was quite good. I think he looks naturally fast in coverage. I think, sure, he's not going to be the guy who's going to fly downhill and hit the run. But shockingly, there are plenty of defenses where while you need to do a job, that doesn't have to be the focal point of your job. He's one of the more natural safeties in space, in my opinion. And I still think he's really good. Obviously, the NFL has concerns about his tackling. And you know what? I can splash some water in my face and get real about that. But uh, he's, oh, did we already put him in there? Good. The second you said it, I was sold. Because on last week's episode, me and Steve talked about him. And I waxed poetic for five straight minutes about how this guy can move like Eddie Jackson. And I Mm -hmm. don't know exactly what that means that he's good at. But it just seems like he's floating on air. And that means something. So in my I'm, opinion, I'm with in, you. In my opinion, Steve, the hardest part about safety uh, when it comes to evaluating is that what the NFL mm-hmm. wants to see is that they want to see translatable reps, right? And mm-hmm. how good your defense is is pretty much the only driver behind whether you get any of those at, at the uh, like as far as what your tape looks like. My favorite example of what I'm talking about: go turn on USC's game against Oregon, and you will see one of the most embarrassing defensive performances that you're going to find from their corners and their linebackers. They allowed all kinds of not only yards underneath, but massive long touchdowns. What was one safety and deep coverage going to do about it when he shaded the other way? And then they threw a touchdown to the other side. He didn't do his job wrong, but when out of 11, four guys don't do their job and you're the one in the back, you're going to look like a fool when then You drive downhill to tackle, you get the angle modestly wrong, and you end up being a tackle that gets broken. Now, Q and I have talked about this a lot. In my opinion, if the safety can even just be a tackle that slows down the rusher, that's drastically more helpful than the guys who can't make the tackle because they're too slow and the guys who can't cover at all. But that's just my bent, is I'd rather see a safety that can cover, and I'll figure out whether they can play the run later. When we get to these box safety types... I'll make an exception, but there's a lot of guys that bang the table during draft season for, I'm just going to go there. The Jaquan Brisker types that then your defensive coordinator that drafted him doesn't want to play too high anymore because too high exposes half field coverage for Brisker who ended up getting torched enough times in coverage that they don't want to do it in key scenarios. That to me is the nightmare scenario. Kalen Bullock keeps me out of that. Even if we miss a couple tackles. Now, like so it. I'm sitting here looking at looking at the D linemen, the offense tackles, the edge rushers, all this, and saying I'm good on this tier. But the one guy who I do hesitate with in your position group, Rob, is Dadrian Taylor Demerson. Have you watched much of him? What do you think there is there? He's a whole lot of fun. I think he's one tier below Kalen Bullock, but the same functional player. Uh, I have watched some of him. <laughs> he's not the most explosive guy. He's not the longest guy and he's not the greatest tackler. But as far as center field free safety, he does a lot of the things that you're looking for. I really like him as a player. And the moment you crack that open, I think Oladapo and Simpson are also in this tier. They just play different ways. Oladapo is more of your jack of all trades, way too old, but at least he's very athletic to go with it. And then Simpson is ultra light but has some of the best instincts in the class and i went searching for better and i didn't find it and so he is caleb bullock but we specialized even further like to a scary degree because he's 175 pounds but he gets there faster than most players and i think that makes a big difference now in that same tier i mean i i think both makai wingo and mason smith belong in that same tier personally Steve, do you have any issues with either of those? No, I don't have any issues with either of those guys. If you want to put them there, that's fine. I do think that we need to start putting Booker and Nealon in the year. I would think maybe even 9.1, to be honest. I know Booker didn't yeah. test well athletically, which is a huge concern for an edge rusher, but his tape is really good. Um, and Nealon, Nealon, I wish I had more tape of his. That's the only problem. Like I, I can't 
arguably argue passionately about him because there's so little all 22 out there about him. I'm based off the broadcast angle, which I don't love doing. Uh, but I think both those guys are, are going to be good. And I think both those, at least I think the NFL is going to be really high on Neyland, especially the bears, because he's a bigger, bigger defensive end who can play good, play the run. Well. Um, so I think 9.1 or at least, at least 9.2. Okay. Do you think even nine for Neyland? I think the NFL is going to be high on him, but again, I can't, it's hard for me to say because I don't have it's I'm basing that more off of what I've read. If you I've don't read. have conviction, you go conservative, right? Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. I agree. So then Brandon Coleman, Steve. I mean, I like Brandon Coleman's tape a lot, but what do you think? Where where do you think he belongs in this in this picture? His it's so difficult because his 2022 tape is so good. Um, it's really good. His 2022 tape is probably in tier five, six, like something like that. His 2023 tape wasn't as good, but he was also being moved around a lot. I, I think that kind of messed with him. Um, I don't know. I can't remember. I watched his tape a while ago. I can't remember if there was injury stuff in there or not. I think he definitely belongs in in 9.2 at the latest, maybe 9.1. But so yeah, was there any injuries in there? None. That I haven't. I haven't been able to search yet. Then I, I, I go nine. So where did we have Blake Fisher? What what tier? Blake did we have Fisher. We had him. Let's see. Tier nine. Tier nine. I put him at nine point one then. Okay. And then Rob, do you think Cam Kitchens does he does he Cam, end up in the top one hundred? Does was his testing put you off too much? What do you got? I think he can be in nine point two. The problem I had with Kitchens is everybody loved him. Everybody thought he was awesome, and. I watched the tape and I saw somebody who was a little slow to the ball. <laughs> and so I couldn't figure out why, because he seemed like he started quickly enough. And I refuse to believe that an athlete that moved as fluidly as he did, didn't have the explosion. Right. Q, does that make sense? Yeah. But seeing the explosion, I was like, oh, and when you went to the senior bowl, look, I, I hate pauses too. Forgive me for that one. But there is something about the Senior Bowl that is really helpful. Q, did you watch any Kinchin's tape before we went to the Senior Bowl? No. <laughs> so maybe then you looked at him and you didn't realize that he's a lot smaller in person than he looks at Miami. At Miami, he looked 6'1". At the Senior Bowl, he looked 5'11". And I personally thought that, that uh, yeah, it has to drop him a little bit. He's instinctive. He's versatile. He's the kind of guy that wouldn't surprise me if he ends up being a forgotten safety in the class just because he's not amazing at anything. Another guy that I think ought to be in this conversation is Bo Brady from Maryland, but that's me saying that. That is nobody else. Nobody put him anywhere that's like close to that. He's down there at 110 because of my high grade on him. So no, if you, to... you might be higher on him than me. Let me see. If you wanted to put so him I, in I nine... graded him, my, my uneducated mind. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't say that because Let's Brady see. is. Yeah. So I wasn't much. I mean, I was within range. Brady is somebody that I have as a true project, but I love what he could be as a project. So maybe we big, we put him 9.3 where I'm openly stating that he's a much messier player than plenty. But man, Q, which games did you watch? Just out of curiosity. I watched Ohio State in 2022 and Ohio State in 2023. So the one that I know I watched was his game against uh, it might have been Ohio State, but I think it was Michigan and PFF gave him a horrible grade. I loved what he was trying to do. He was one of the only players that actually created any chaos. I think if we wanted to get into 9.3, are you cool with that during Cooper there? Yeah, I, I'm cool with him. I'm just going to say it. I'm cool with Tavadri Sweat there, too. Like if I can get that guy on a Zoom call and ask him. What on earth were you thinking? And he gives me mm -hmm. a decent answer. There's just not yeah. a lot of guys that big that can handle that kind of mash at the point of attack. And that always appeals to me. But uh, yeah, I, don't I mean, I, I think off. keeping him in the top 100 makes a lot of sense. That's right around 90. Like that feels right now. So we are into our last 10, 11 guys here. So what I would like to say at this point, who are you pounding the table for? Like, who is making this list over the rest of these guys? Uh, Steve, I think you're on mute there. No, still nothing. Okay, so the only one from my group that I think is worth thinking about, 
I would ask the room what I thought about Cole Bishop who tested really, really well. He was the better of the Utah safeties, though. I didn't think he was outstanding. The one that always gets me Q, we've all got our bents. And when you play star for a Saban defense, you have my attention. And so that's Tyke Smith, the safety. And he's somebody that I don't know. He's right there at 98. You don't have to scroll too far down. Yeah. Um, He's older for sure, but he's a hellion against the run and he's got solid ability in pass coverage. I don't quite know where he'd play, but he's somebody that I'm thinking about. Andrew Phillips had an incredibly impressive senior bowl and I can't stop thinking about Kalen Carson. He's a nasty wants to fight you corner. And I always think that's fun when you've got movement ability that he does. And in particular, I love to see instincts from a corner and Kalen was one of the rare outside corners willing to break on balls underneath as they were thrown, even when he thought that would get him in trouble. So to me, I saw a defender in Kalen, and I'm not I'm not surprised that plenty saw what they saw wanting to grade him lower because he wasn't clean. Of course, he wasn't clean. He played for Wake. And when you play for Wake Forest defense, you need to be a playmaker or you're just waiting to lose it is sort of how I see it. But that could be me wiggling into his head too much. Those are the all, three guys that I'm pounding for. All, I think all three of us did like Kalen Carson to some degree. I, I know, Steve, I don't think you got a grade in here on him, but I know you made a video on him and. I believe yeah, you made a, video, a video on Carson. Uh, okay, then who am I? I might be mistaking him for someone else. Then. I, uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe Mustafa. Oh, I'm thinking of Mustafa. I'm thinking of Mustafa. And Mustafa's fun. Mustafa, to me, just he, he's a little small. And he's really fast to the ball. But he's mm. the kind of guy that I would draft as a teamer. And if he shocked me and ends up making the field as a safety, I'm happy with it. And I'll pretend I planned it all along. Now, so did you want to get Cole Bishop in here? I heard you mention it. I mentioned him. Uh, I would pound the table for the other three before it. Drew okay. Phillips even is one of those guys where um, he's sort of my Shane Falco of the class, if that makes sense, uh, Q, where yeah. it's like it, I still think he might not have the size to play outside, which would limit him as a nickel. And if he's playing nickel, yikes, that sucks for his value. But he's got that hot. He's one of the few guys at the Senior Bowl that I thought played well above what he should have against the better receiver group, him Jarvis Brownlee. And who's the other one? It was like Carlton something. Uh, those three ended up having a really strong couple days at the senior bowl with uh, against lab McConkey, Johnny Wilson, Jamari thrash, and a bunch of the other really solid receivers that were there again, right. relying a lot on the senior bowl, but yeah, it was good for them. Now, Steve, how about you? Who who's left here? And let me know if yeah. it's any position you want me to specifically narrow down on this board. But who are you pounding the table for that you want in the top 100? I think Dominic Pooney deserves to be a top 100 player in this class. Just the position uh, flexibility he has. I know he's an older prospect, but he could play. He played left tackle in college. He's probably going to be guard in the NFL. I know he, he's been working out at center as well, which is very interesting. So I think in in a class that we've discussed, you know, is kind of weak and there's a fall off there. I think he's a, a, a top 100 player for sure. And I like this guy. I don't love him, but I think he deserves to be a top 100 player. And that's Jatavion Sanders uh, from Texas, the tight end. Again, I didn't love his tape. I liked it. Uh, I see the upside with him. And I just think in this week class, like that's a top 100 player. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't be pounding the table for him if anyone uh, disagrees. But I think I think just seeing the names around him, I, I would take him over a lot of these guys. Now, do we think we are being too hard on Adisa Isaac? No. No, we think he is borderline top 100. Yeah, I, I, I don't see the top 50 hype that he's getting. Um, I see the athleticism, so I, I guess maybe I do see the top 50 hype because people just see the athleticism and say, okay, we can work with that. But for a guy who I, I just didn't see much beyond the, just beyond the athleticism, he didn't have like a pass rush plan. He wasn't really winning, you know. He, well, he's the not outside. that outstanding of an athlete either. Like he's he's got some yeah. bend, and that's that that's really he's got what some we're bend, talking yeah, about. So, it, maybe he's a top 100 player. Like I would not argue too much about that, but the top 50 hype, you can miss me with that. And so to be clear in our graphic, 9.5 are guys who they might not make it. 9.4 are the guys who we're pounding the table for. Um, yeah. And so on my front at the 9.4, I've got a handful of guys. So I've got Tyler Davis. I do not understand why everyone is so low on him. 
I was going to ask you, Q, seeing him there, do you think, I mean, to me, the moment he gets around here, it looks like he made a plain Jane mistake not declaring last year. So let's mm-hmm. start there. Was it a mistake or do you think something happened? I think his injury history it is a real play here. And he, he's had a few injuries over the years. Nothing that screams I should be scared about it, but I do think it's it's a guy who you worry might get banged up a, a, quite a bit. You know, missed two games, missed three games with a torn bicep, missed two games with an MCL strain, missed three games with an ankle. Every year it's something different. So you do worry a little bit about that, and some of that's his play style. But, man, I mean, he's got a quick first step. He's built like a bowling ball. He can play either spot. I mean, I, I just – I do not – see a guy that you're saying can't play in your rotation for years. 100%. So, He's at least a ro- rotational early down run defender, at least. And you yeah. got to hope you just unlock a little bit more pass rush from him. But high floor player, so top 100 easy. Now, I'm also pounding the table for Audric Estime. I think this guy's just going to be good. I He he ran a 4-7 at the Combine. That is a major red flag. But he also... Had a 130 inch broad jump and killed all his explosive testing. He might get caught from behind here and there, but he's more explosive than David Montgomery. So I'll live with it. He's going to plow through people. He's just the, the funniest translation I can put on it is I was listening to the PFF running back show the other day and they said, according to their model, hand size is the most correlative thing to running back success. And he's that got mitts. He's got mitts, man. He's got like that's analytics. Hands. Yeah, can't argue <laughs> with that. Can't argue I, 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 I love his tape. And then um, Braylon Trice. I know Steve. Both you and Tom are lower on him than the consensus. I think I'm a yeah. touch lower than the consensus. But man, I watched the guy's tape. He just knows what he's doing. He's, yeah, I'm I don't always going to be a star, but I think even in the 90s, we're a little too low on him here. I almost think he belongs in the 70s. Yeah, we might be overcorrecting on him a little bit because I think what happened was he was getting a lot of like first round hype. And then we watched him and we're like, this guy's not a first round player. And maybe we overcorrected and put him too low. Um, I think he's he's got a high motor and teams are going to love him. I just don't he doesn't have the bend or the flexibility to be a yeah. top tier pass rusher, but he could be a rotational pass rusher. Sure. So yeah. if and and in this class, a top 100 player, uh, I'm okay with that. So I would wager we put him in tier 9.1 because that puts him in in like 80, 82, 83 range. Okay. Okay. And let's see how many players that gets us here. That should get us right around. It the should top be 100. The... I think we <laughs> bang. That gets us 101. And we did it. Disa Isaac just misses the cut. <laughs> we did it all right and and let's there's just some move. there's some good players that we've got all yeah. throughout this but i do agree with you guys that as we go through this as we go through this exercise it becomes pretty obvious i mean i don't want to, i don't want to say obvious but ryan poles draft decisions make a little bit more sense to me as we go through this class where with number one and number nine Ryan Poles potentially taking a year to prioritize veterans so that he can stabilize the team around mm-hmm. Caleb Williams. Because look, I completely understand our position as fans. What we, what we want to see, like right now, if you had to, Steve, I'm going to put you on the spot. If I asked you, which would you prefer? The Bears win 11 games, lock that in now. Caleb throws for 4,100 yards, lock that in now. Are you going with the latter? Uh, yes. Oh yeah. Most okay. people Caleb would. over everything. Yeah. Most people would because Caleb over everything, except I can't help but think that in a real football ecosystem, stability and the ability to play as a team and effectively like learn how you guys are going to win and then progress from there might be something that at least the bears value more, but it wouldn't surprise me if the NFL in general thinks more that way. And so Ryan Poles' decisions to me reek of, well, we're not going to be able to win without a pass rusher that as such, you lose your second rounder. Well, we're not going to be able to win without a center and some decent rotational depth. Thus you lose your fifth rounder. We're not going to be able to win without a decent second receiver. Thus you lose one of your fourth rounders. You get Keenan Allen. Obviously you already, you know, 
threw away Dan Feeney and uh, was it Nikhil Harry in this yeah. same draft? So rip those picks. But <clears throat> you, you look at this class and I'm strangely unbothered with one nine seventy five. What do you guys think? Yeah, I'd still, you know, I'd still really like to get another second round pick. And like in my last mock, I traded 75 and one of next year's seconds to get up to 45 for Ricky Pearsall or Keon Coleman. Those were the two guys who I was picking between there. And like, that's, that's something that I can get behind with that as long as, I mean, I guess that doesn't even make sense though, because that was with the caveat that I can get Hunter Norzad at 117. And I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> I don't care. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I think I'm more. Yeah. Pick someone at nine. Pick, don't don't bother training back in this draft class. Get the blue chippers, you know, with a caveat there. It it depends who's available at nine, obviously. If you could trade back a little bit and get an extra pick and and still get an edge player or something, that's that's fine. But I wouldn't trade back too far. Get get your top, don't worry about how many picks you have, get your top tier players, especially just looking at this, man. Like we have like what when we have pick 122, like the and we just ranked out a hundred players, like. I, I don't really like anyone else that's like on this board. Like you're not going to yeah. get, I don't, I don't I mean, need an, I don't need a late pick on any, on any of these guys. You're could these guys Tommy turn Eichenberg? out to be good? I'm sure they could. Um, you get Tommy but, Eichenberg and you're going to like it, even though I'd love hey, Theo Johnson around there. The pride of St. Ignatius high school in Cleveland, Ohio, Tommy Eichenberg. There'll be no disrespect on this podcast for him. Q before we sign off, we've just got a super chat for 20 bucks from the oh, Bears wow. department. They asked, uh, where do you guys have Zach Zinter? So as a thank you, take us through what you guys think about Zinter. So Zinter was one of the first guys I watched. And oh man, I I loved his tape. You want to talk about a guy who is just an offensive guard through and through, just gonna he's out there to rip your heart out. There, there was a quote from when he first committed to Michigan that was like, I just want the guy I'm going against, I want his mom in the sands to see what I did to him. What? Yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous. That's the type of player that Zach Zinter is, and Ooh. I utterly love it. it, it it's not where, words. He does this. To, like, put him up another half round. Yeah, I was going to say, playing. where is he on our board? He's top 20, top 20. <laughs> <laughs> like it's just 66 I mean, we, way we too low. 66 right here and probably even a little higher than that once once i got in just based on the, the grades within the yeah. tier but he is just a fun football player he's strong he's mean he's got adequate athleticism and i don't really know if he can pass block or not because michigan didn't pass the football <laughs> but at guard with the way that he run blocks i'll live with it I, i'm I am very excited to watch Zach Zinter in the NFL. Steve, what do you think? That's my my what I was gonna say is this going from the scheme, it's just a hard player to project, given that you just don't have as many pass block reps as you want to. But everything you said, he's such a good run blocker and he does everything well and the tenacity. And now that I hear that quote, I have no doubt in my mind that this guy's gonna be in a Hall of Fame right guard for someone. Let me see here. So I got the quote. <laughs> My head is like, you go out there and that dude, his mom is in the stands too. And you're just burying him right in front of his mom. There's something messed up in my head probably when I'm saying that. Embarrassing him in front of his mom. But it's football. You need to tweet that. You need to tweet it's that. Incredible. Yeah, that's, I, I, I'm I, like, no, no joke. Let's put him in tier seven. Like, no joke. Like, let's move him up. I mean, I'm here for it. It's the right <laughs> attitude. And I mean, not to, okay. One other thing I'll point out, there's a lot of people that have told me that a lot of players are nasty. And then you turn on their film and it's very obvious Larry Borum is not nasty, if that makes sense. Another another one of my favorite examples. I think Nate Davis is much more a technician than people realize because I kept hearing he was a mauler. And I was like, I've watched four games. I don't see the mauler that everybody keeps telling me I'm seeing because there's an element of physical overpowerment that comes from there. Everybody who is labeled a baller accurately, I don't you rarely see bad old linemen when it comes to guards and centers at that spot. Am I nuts here or am I just biased towards violent people? No, I think you're right. I'm, I think you're very right. I, Look, I, think I also 
The the only thing you were wrong about the only thing you were wrong about is I've seen a lot of nasty stuff from Larry Borum. Just maybe not what you were talking about. Oh, oh nasty no. stuff as in not good. <laughs> it, it, well, I'm specifically thinking about when he was at Missouri, where people mistaked being way bigger than the other guy playing at like 365 for nastiness, which is more that like yeah. Evan Jenkins plant your hands and put the guy on his butt kind of nastiness. Yeah. And <clears throat> it's hard to find, not to mention the NFL is a, it's a parade of freaks, right? All across every position. What works to bury the guy playing defensive end at Rutgers on scholarship, who's really excited about the business that he's going to found in a couple of years, but right now he's playing football. Like that's a little different than when you bury a uh, Khalil Mack or Miles Garrett or Preston Smith or anybody. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough yeah. transition, but like you're talking about Q, when you have that attitude, I mean, attitude's half the battle. So I, I would love to see the bears find a way to add an interior lineman in the third round. If I got to choose, let, we could wrap up with this if you guys want to. If I got to choose, I would love for the Bears to find some way to trade back, add a second round pick, and go defensive impact player, best receiver available, best interior lineman available, and pretty much call it a draft. I would, I would be surprised if they wouldn't get a good player at all three of those spots. But I also know I'm gaming the draft a little bit and frankly asking for a trade back that I don't know if it's going to materialize. Because at this stage, it would not surprise me if the Bears get snaked at pick number eight for Roma Dunze. And then at nine, they're sitting there pitching a trade back to Olu Fashanu or JC Latham. And maybe somebody would come up for them. Maybe, maybe not. And so you may end up stuck picking at nine. Then you go nine. And I worry about their wide receiver options at 75, Steve. I really do. I, th I like a lot of these wide receivers, and I think they'd all be gone by then. Yeah. I was just thinking that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's when you do good mock draft simulators, you can always get a good wide receiver at seventy-five. I don't know if that's going to be actually what's going to happen. I think there's going to be a run on them, and, and you might be drafting wide receiver fifteen at, at seventy-five. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, maybe not fifteen, but you know, you're 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 picking the the last tier of good guys. So we'll see. Yeah. And I just want to say we're sorry to you guys who, who were asking questions in the comments, trying to get through a hundred guys in two hours. We just didn't have time to to, to stop for breaks. <laughs> Come in next week, the weeks after, we'll answer your questions. And a huge shout out to the Bears Department for the super chat. We love to see that. We thank you so much for it and for listening. And did you guys have anything else you wanted to mention to finish up with here? I'm good. I had I had one thing I want to I want to know because it's like it's something that the last few weeks I've really just been playing around with in my mind after a friend of mine was talking about something of like athletically in basketball like either you can dunk or you can't like it's just that simple and it was just like it set off a trigger in my head of man I really struggle to scout speed something I've learned over the last two years of doing this speed is not something I understand speed agility it's something I've never had. I've never been able to win with speed or agility in my entire life. So me recognizing someone winning with speed or agility is just very difficult for me. I have a really easy time recognizing guys win with power and force and hand placement, hand usage, being beating a guy to a spot. But the actual aspect of like wide receiver and cornerback play where the speed that they operate with and their agility, their ability to move differently. It's just not something that I recognize. It's something I've never understood. And it ends up with me loving guys like Keon Coleman, you know, because I'm like, yes, I know that I, I recognize that and I feel it. And it's just, I just, th I think it's an interesting aspect of scouting that had never occurred to me before this moment. Rob, I think you're muted. To me, Q, I think it's it's hard. It's not easy. Not to mention, I think football's a funky game. Like to use an example, let's let's talk about a player, two players that me and Steve disagree on. And Steve, more power to you. Knowing how this works, Javon Baker's going to be a stud, and I'm going to look like I've got egg on my face. I'm ready <laughs> for it, right? But to me, Javon doesn't play with enough speed and he doesn't play with enough power when we are talking about the next level. It's not to say I hate him. It's more to say when we look at who's going to be a wide receiver two as opposed to a wide receiver three, because there's this point you get into, um, gosh, I'm trying to remember his last name, the Nebraska receiver, 
from last year, now playing on the Buccaneers. Oh, his name was Trey Palmer. 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 I yeah. hated his tape because he couldn't beat man coverage to save his life. He goes to the Buccaneers. Guess what? He never did. He, they didn't ask him to against man coverage. They threw to uh, they threw to Mike Evans anyways. It didn't matter. And so then Trey, or Trey Palmer ends up shaking loose underneath against zone coverages and playing yak uh, a yak role nearly all the time. It's funny, though, Q, to, to wrap back all the way. Because when I see Keon Coleman, I see a power forward, somebody who's not fast. He's not trying to be. He's he's trying to get body position, ask the quarterback to throw to a spot and then let him go get it. And I didn't think Jordan Travis had the ability to do it. Right. But I think you encapsulated this perfectly. When you look at left tackle Q, you want a left tackle that can hit a step back jumper in warmups and Darnell Wright can. Right. Like when you you want him to look like an athlete when he's doing athletic things. And I think that that makes scouting so funky in many of these cases where sometimes you can recognize that I think in my case, it's Byron Murphy is an athlete. Is he a football player's football player yet? Johnny's definitely better. But if they both had the same level of football playerness, who would be like who would yeah. immediately rise to the top? And that's not a fair question. But it's one I do think the NFL asks because the other piece of this cue that I always think gets forgotten, every coach thinks that that garbage college coach is as bad as you and I think Penn State's coach or coaches are. <laughs> like every every single org thinks, yeah, but when I get him in my building, we're gonna fix him. <laughs> and I always imagine they're that all that Brock Olivo, well. man. They're all Brock Olivo, right? <laughs> All right. Well, I think that will do it for us, folks. Thank you guys so much for sitting through us with it, for going through these players, <clears> listening. <throat> Make sure to go check out our scouting reports. We have a scouting report on almost every single one of these players we talked about over at ontapsportsnet.com. At the end of this week, we are coming out with our draft guide, the Building the Board 2024 NFL Draft Guide for the Chicago Bears. So make sure to go check that out, ontapsportsnet.com. And we thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great night. We'll talk to you later.